בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are uh, back here doing our שיעורים, ברוך השם, the stump the rabbi, we'll uh, after a little bit of דברי תורה, some Torah thoughts that uh, we learned this week. זאת השם, you guys will uh, ask some questions, הקדוש ברוך הוא, זאת השם will give us some answers. Um, so a couple of uh, brief uh, updates. Uh, first off, actually, the uh, shiu is uh, going to be for Refua Shlema, for Rabbanit uh, Sara Bat Levana, uh, Rabbanit uh, Levana Bat Sara, uh, Rav Ephraim Ben Shulamit, uh, Nehorai Emet Ben uh, Hadassa, um, also for uh, Moshe Ben Avraham, Avi Mori David Ben Asriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, and also for the Atzlacha Rabah for Marsha Bat Juli, Ayla Bat Marsha, uh, Samuel Ben Marsha, Sephas Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Louis Ben Marsha, and all of Am Yisrael, all the righteous Noahides that continue to learn with us, continue to invest their time and their efforts in learning our Shurim without straying right or left, just simply want the Emet and doing their best, truly their best, to fulfill the will of Hashem and uh, following the Torah as, uh, as a Kadosh Baruch Hu wants us to. Uh, and also, of course, for all of you uh, that uh, contribute, uh, whether a lot or a little, uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu will bless each and every single person to uh, continue uh, helping us and being partners with us and all the amazing things that the organization is doing. Uh, for some of you that uh, were clever enough to know and have watched our shiurim for long enough to know that uh, we always have a campaign uh, to feed the poor uh, on a monthly basis. We're continuously trying to help uh, Avrechim and uh, from our kolel, from outside of our kolel. Uh, you know, uh, every, every month there's some type of uh, story that's new that uh, we try to, uh, to help with uh, to the best of our abilities. And of course, during the holidays, we had a campaign, uh, uh, you know, that we were able to help uh, Baruch Hashem, quite a few people for Shavuot. We didn't have a campaign online simply because I just don't have the time uh, to do it, but a few of you, Baruch Hashem, uh, sent some money to become partners in it. Uh, anyone that wants to uh, help the poor uh, doesn't even have to ask uh, whether there's a campaign or not. There's always one. There's always people that need help. Uh, sometimes it's a uh, orphan. Sometimes it's a widow. Sometimes it's a woman that uh, is uh, being abused by her husband and we're trying to help her. Sometimes it's a uh, man that's being abused by his wife and we're trying to help him. And sometimes it's an avrech that learns 15, 16, 17 hours a day uh, just to get the uh, $500 a month that he gets paid at some kolel. Uh, sometimes it's our own dear avrechim that Baruch Hashem, each and every one of them is continuing to prosper in the world of Torah. Uh, and Baruch Hashem, we have uh, quite a bit uh, of uh, expenses that uh, are investments. That's the way we look at it. We look at it as all as, as expenses. I spoke to uh, uh, someone today, one of uh, my dear Talmidim, and uh, we're talking about uh, the, the updates of what's going on with finding a space uh, so we could actually finally bring to fruition uh, the dream of uh, opening a uh, yeshiva, a kolel, a Bet uh, Midrash, a synagogue, of course, uh, something that, uh, you know, will, uh, will get us into a, uh, an actual place. Baruch Hashem, over the last uh, few weeks, we were uh, back into uh, search and saw a few places. There's a uh, couple of places that are uh, very, very high potential, uh, especially the one uh, that we saw today. Uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, and and really the, the biggest the, the biggest issue is no uh, longer the uh, you know where how who it, it's simply money. Uh, there's simply a lot of money that's uh, that's needed, and uh, uh, regardless of uh, how much the organization grows, the the expenses continue to grow with them. So I told them that you know right now just to uh, to, uh, to be able to keep the lights on. Uh, between all of the projects, all of the people that we help, all of the different campaigns to feed the poor, uh, the, the films, every, everything cost a lot of money where, you know, we had the uh, expenses of about $150,000 per month in uh, the year 2021. Uh, so it's $1.8 million. It's a lot of money. Baruch uh, Hashem Hashem provided. But at the same token, you know, the, uh, you know, unlike... Uh, the uh, traditional business, you know, the world of, uh, of, of Kiruv, the world of Torah, 
There's nothing to depend on other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. One day you could have a, uh, a donor that uh, you helped, that was inspired by you, uh, make you the number one investment in their, of their Maser or even of their Chomesh. And uh, the next day they simply uh, don't want to or they can't or they, uh, they feel like they can do something else. So there's never anything that you can uh, depend on. There's never anyone that you can depend on other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And uh, this is the reason why a, uh, the, the biggest hurdle in, in taking on new projects, whether it's uh, this or that, is always funds, always to get more and more money, uh, to be able to do more and more things, because unlike uh, many other organizations, quite frankly, uh, all organizations that I know of, everything that we do is free. You know, uh, it's a, we, we have a, uh, uh, a joke, an inside joke in the organization as far as when we get new books or USBs or CDs or whatever it is, we have an j- inside joke of, yeah, let's put it in the store, we'll try to sell it. And <laughs> Uh, it's, it's an inside joke because we know already ahead of time, uh, even before we decide to print hundreds of thousands of copies, that uh, 99.999% of them are going to be distributed for free and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is simply going to put the bill somewhere, somehow. So, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, we have a couple of really big things that were released uh, in the last 24 hours that we've talked about already for the last month and a half. Kuntres Genom and Kuntres uh, Gerim. The Kuntres Genom is based on the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. For any of you that are uh, loyal to the teachings of Hasidut, whether it's uh, the Hasidut of uh, of Tzans or or uh, or Chabad or it's a uh, Buber or it's uh, uh, Breslev, wherever you are, uh, this is a must-read uh, Kuntres, and it's now being distributed for free as as far as a hard copy. The, uh, the soft copy, the digital copy has been on our website, bezatashem.org, on the ebook section for free already for, for a long time. Um, and since it was published, I think about a year ago or so. But now we have the hard copies in the United States. We've already distributed uh, something like, I think, uh, 15 or 20,000 copies in Eretz Yisrael. Baruch Hashem had created quite a commotion because a lot of these writings from the Baal Shem Tov, from the Magid Mezrich, uh, from uh, Rabbi Elimelech Milizhinsk or, or any of the other great uh, sages, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Baal Atanya, Rabbi Nachman Breslo, of course, all of these great sages, many of their teachings in regarding to the subject of Genom, of reward and punishment, uh, are simply unknown uh, or they're just uh, glossed over where people don't truly understand the significance of them. So, Baruch Hashem, our own very dear uh, genius uh, Gaon uh, Rav Ephraim, Put together a kuntres. It's very short. It's only about 40 pages or so, but it's full of sources. It's full of uh, things that are very, very easy to understand and read if you read, if you speak the Hebrew language. Uh, for those of you that, of course, already asking, is there an English version of it uh, available? Not yet. That takes a lot of work and time. And uh, uh, even though we have, Baruch Hashem, translators on our team that uh, do the translations for some of Rabbi Ephraim's lectures and some of the other things that we do, uh, when it comes to books, it uh, you know at this time requires my help, uh, also which uh, unfortunately time is limited. Uh, you know, 20 hours a day is not enough. If we could only get 40 or 50 hours a day, perhaps we could uh, fulfill all of our uh, uh, desires uh, as far as our avodat Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Uh, and uh, and and the key is that uh, at one point we are looking to uh, you know um, have them in English, all of these books in English, but that takes time takes time, also it takes a lot of money to, to print each time, it's another 20, another 30, another 50, another $100,000, all of these things take time, Baruch Hashem, the distribution of my book, Yasem uh, Bar Le'agamayim, has uh, already uh, surpassed, I think, something like 15 or 20,000 copies in Eretz Yisrael, there's a, uh, also another, I think maybe around uh, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 copies uh, in, in the United States, so Baruch Hashem, we're... Uh, a lot of people are getting the book. Quite a bit of uh, good feedback from it, Baruch Hashem. Uh, and uh, we're looking to continue doing more and more. Uh, again, that too, we'll look to uh, translate to English at one point or another. But uh, the reason why we, my personal book we did uh, with, uh, in, in Hebrew first is because you know, the English-speaking world already has the majority of the content, uh, the majority of the Torah that we teach in English already. So we figured that to address the uh, the Hebrew market, uh, Hebrew speaking market, 
uh, we uh, we should do something uh, you know uh, like that. Uh, and Bezal Hashem, you know, the book will come to, the book will come to. Uh, so that's that. So anyone that wants to distribute uh, copies of the Kuntres Genom, you just go to uh, uh, kiruvstore.org or bhkiruv.org and you order yourself uh, one batch. Each batch is 50 copies. And it's, again, very easy to distribute. You just go to your synagogue, hand it to people in their hand. What is it? Just read it. It's a tiny little thing. And uh, get enlightened and, and, and quite frankly, the few that uh, I've spoken to that I've already read it uh, have been, uh, you know, uh, simply dumbfounded. They just couldn't believe that they were from Hasidim for 20, 30, 40 years and have never heard any of this stuff. And this is from their books. It's not uh, something that uh, we found in some uh, some cave. This is from their books. It's just that, again, the Yetzirah is uh, working very, very hard uh, against the uh, the foundation of our entire Torah, which is the teachings of Yirat Shemaim. Uh, further, there's also Kuntres Agerim. This is uh, another Kuntres by uh, 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 a book by uh, Rav Ephraim with uh, different uh, writings of the sages, which also includes a responsa that Rav Ephraim wrote in regards to whether a Jew should marry a, uh, a convert or not. Uh, you know, the, uh, the the pros, the cons, all of the different things that people talk about. This is very relevant to uh, today's world where, uh, you know, uh, more than half of the Jewish people live outside of Eretz Yisrael, uh, you know, surrounded by non-Jews and are easily confused uh, by uh, what they think is love and really it's actual lust. And of course, sometimes you find somebody that actually wants to convert and, you know, and a key is, should I, shouldn't I? There are certain communities that are against converts. There's uh, uh, certain things that people say that are very nasty. And of course, we've discussed all of these different things in Shulim in the past. This is, again, a, a, a very, very uh, important uh, uh, um, kuntres because it gives you the Torah's perspective of what a Kadosh Baruch Hu uh, thinks about righteous converts, uh, a little bit about wicked converts, of course, uh, that perhaps the, the whole shiur that we'll do very soon about, uh, something shocking that we recently learned with Rabbi Ephraim, something that happened at the, at the time of David Melech. Uh, but uh, we'll leave that suspense for you guys uh, to stay tuned in. But nonetheless, this, uh, this Kuntres, also each batch comes with 50 copies. Uh, you can give it out in your community if they know how to read the Sidur, to pray, then surely they'll know how to read this uh, Kuntres. It's with Nikud, it's easy, it's uh, short, uh, and it's to the point. Uh, so that those two things are available now on our uh, Kiruv store. It's free, but again, for the shipping purposes, we're, uh, we're, uh, uh, because shipping is just simply so expensive, we're spending thousands of dollars on shipping every month, and that's, uh, you know, uh, we have to keep it mainly for U.S., U.S. Uh, 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 shipping. We've already distributed tens of thousands of copies in Eretz Israel, and we're going to try to ship as many as possible in uh, in the uh, states. I think we have something like maybe five or six thousand left, so there's not many left. But Baruch Hashem, a lot of people already ordering them. If you want them for your community, whether your community is for converts or against converts, surely you're going to want to know all of the wonderful things that the sages have uh, uh, said in regards to this. Uh, last but not least, uh, there is a uh, our next Chizuk event is uh, scheduled for the 22nd of June, uh, according to the Gregorian calendar. This is only in the next couple of weeks uh, here in South Florida at the uh, same location at the Hilton. Uh, Baruch Hashem, the last event was a success. It was a very nice place and uh, uh, easy to uh, uh, to get to. Uh, so all of you are welcome, whether you live in uh, Florida or you live in uh, Massachusetts or you live in Australia, you're all welcome. Uh, it's a free event. Just please RSVP so we can prepare ahead of time to know who's coming so we can bring uh, enough uh, wonderful free gifts and, uh, and surely uh, be prepared for the crowd. So anyone that's coming, please, please try to bring somebody with you. One, two, five, 20 people. Bring as many people as possible, and uh, you know. But try to make sure that you keep your word. When you say you're coming, show up. You know, last day, uh, two events, we had a couple of people that said they're coming with twenty or thirty people, and not only they didn't come with twenty or thirty people, they themselves didn't come. So things like that are annoying uh, and also uh, costly. 
simply because we prepare things uh, 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 in accordance to what we think is going to show up. So anyone's going to come, please come and try to bring as many people as possible uh, with you, but make sure to show up. Make sure to show up. Uh, so, Baruch Hashem, with that being said, uh, we have our uh, uh, very, very interesting uh, things to, to, to go over tonight because there are a few things that I mentioned in this week's parasha uh, that uh, are some of the things that, you know, a person that's learning Torah uh, and, and is new to it, uh, initially when they first read these things, it's hard to, uh, to grasp how these are relevant to your life. You know, Parashat Naso is a, uh, a unique parasha because it has a lot of these unique laws that a human being simply couldn't have brought into the world for all of the, uh, you know, the, the naysayers, the heretics that think that uh, uh, the Torah is man-made or, uh, or simply uh, uh, don't know right or left of what the Torah even says, but already judged that uh, it's not uh, for them or it's not good in any way, chas v'shalom. It's very important to know not just the laws that are clear to you, that, uh, that you are, uh, you know, uh, easily accepting them, whether it's uh, don't murder or to observe Shabbat or to keep kosher or to have a mezuzah uh, or to put on tefillin, all of these different things uh, have a certain amount of bracha where the vast majority of people that want to do the will of Hashem, uh, you know, are, you know, they accept these things, even though at times it's hard to commit to praying every single day uh, and putting on tefillin and spending a couple of thousand dollars on a good pair of tefillin and spending a few hundred dollars on a good mezuzah and you have five rooms or 10 rooms and you have to put one in every room except the bathroom uh, or a closet uh, unless you're one of these wealthy people that has a closet that's bigger than that's like a bedroom but the point being is at the beginning so you know certain things certain people have certain difficulties with certain mitzvot uh, but if you uh, continue to uh, stay loyal to Hashem, little by little it becomes easier. I remember uh, before I took on the uh, the holy uh, mitzvah of observing Shabbat, you know, we were already learning Torah uh, uh, on a regular basis. We're already keeping kashrut. We're already praying every single day. But Shabbat was something that I didn't get to. Theoretically, in my mind, I thought that this is something that you have to get to. I didn't realize that every single second that I'm alive without observing Shabbat is literally a miracle in itself because HaKadosh Baruch Hu promises in the Torah no less than 12 times that a person, a Jew that does not observe Shabbat is a death penalty, meaning that it's a death penalty at that moment, not in the, some future time. There's death upon death. There's death in this world. There's death in the next world. It's a hor- horrific, atrocious punishment we're not going to get into now but the point being is i thought that yeah observing shabbat yeah one day i'll get to it and then you know one day when my rav told me that it's time for me to observe shabbat uh and he didn't say it in a joking manner he didn't say it in a uh uh in in a funny way he simply told me it's time uh and uh initially i made uh, you know a whole bunch of excuses of why observing shabbat is simply impossible for me uh, but Baruch Hashem, Hashem had mercy on me, and uh, while I was talking, I was listening to myself and realized how I was so full of it, uh, that all of what I said was simply excuses. And the beautiful thing is, is that, uh, you know, when, when you are already connected to, to honesty and, 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 to, and to truth altogether, you realize that even sometimes you yourself have some falsehood and you have to call yourself out. So really, during that same conversation, I told him, listen, everything I just said to you, Kodalab, it's all nonsense. It's all, I'm full of it. I'm taking on Shabbat, even though I have all these excuses. The reality is I have to do it. And I took on Shabbat, Baruch Hashem, and uh, it was the greatest Shabbat in the history of Shabbats. Uh, we, it was so good, we didn't want it to end. We extended the Shabbat. We didn't know if we were allowed to keep it for longer. We just simply didn't want it to end. And, uh, and, and Baruch Hashem, it's, it, it's, it's one of those things where when a person takes on the mitzvah, as Rabbi Chaim Ivolojin says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives him the strength to do it. Once you commit to doing it psychologically, you decide, I'm going to do this. Hashem said this, I'm going to do it. This is a mitzvah, I'm going to do it. Once you commit to doing it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you the strength to do it. Before you've committed to it, HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't necessarily give you the strength to do it in the same tense, simply because you have a yetzerah you have to overcome. You have a yetzerah to overcome. Now, of course, we're created to fulfill the Torah, as Moshe Rabbeinu says in Sefer Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart to fulfill it. The entire Torah 
is something that you are programmed you are programmed you were created to fulfill so all of it is something that you can do there is no such thing as a part of the Torah that you can't do but the the, the obstacle that's in front of you that Yetzirah that evil inclination that confuses you that makes you think you can't do it that makes you think it's too much for you that part once you commit to fighting it Akadosh Baruch Hu says now that you committed now I'm going to join your fight I'm going to beat that Yetzirah and Baruch Hashem it's one of those beautiful things that when you explain it to people how beautiful Shabbat is sometimes it's not enough it's not enough to explain to a person that Shabbat is beautiful it's it's a vacation once a week but much more than a vacation uh simply because you have literally time with yourself to go learn Torah to spend time with the family spend some uh, uh time uh, with the Baruch Hu, to pray to eat to, to do all these wonderful things that really your your mind is, is is not capable of doing during the week when you have you know cell phones and, and and computers and mail and bills and work and all of these different things you don't have it during the week and of course the Yetzirah shows up on on, on Shabbat also and there's always some uh, Yetzirah that makes you want to get into a fight with your spouse or makes your kids extra annoying or or makes your health uh you know fall apart and there's always Yetzirah on Shabbat too uh but needless to say when you understand what shabbat is and you understand that this is my opportunity to to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that the torah that i learned on shabbat according to the ben ishchai and many other chachamim it's worth a thousand times more a thousand times more than the torah that a person learns during the week so much so that when uh uh, uh rabbanit uh, um the rabbanit's uh, dear uh, rabbanit his wife when she was asked how much time does uh Rav Avadia sleep on Shabbat she said I swear to you that from the time that I know him from the time that I know him he has never slept on Shabbat never slept on Shabbat from the time Shabbat starts with the exception of the Kiddush eating quickly with the family he learns Torah non-stop doesn't go to sleep why can't miss out on this opportunity that the Torah that uh, you're learning on Shabbat is a thousand times more uh, uh uh meritorious valuable and, uh, and extraordinary and the Torah that you learn the rest of the week so if somebody had learned Torah non-stop during the rest of the week like Rav Avadia Allah uh, Shalom took advantage of of the opportunity on Shabbat uh needless to say we have to as well but of course the Yetzirah is going to show up and the Yetzirah is going to tell you that you can't do it and it's too much for you and that it's too this and it's too that don't let the Yetzirah fool you don't let the Yetzirah uh, tell you that you can't do it as the Chovot HaLevavot says in the uh, uh, Shara Tshuva that you owe it to yourself you owe it to yourself once you know that the uh, Shem is real and the Torah is real you owe it to yourself have some mercy on yourself says the Chovot HaLevavot have some mercy on your own soul and uh, and, and do Tshuva immediately because he gives a whole list of reasons of why you need to do Tshuva starting with the fact that if you don't do Tshuva you're simply going to get punished which brings us back to the point where sometimes when you tell a person that observing Shabbat is beautiful and you have an opportunity unlike any other that doesn't necessarily always sell and one of the reasons is because many times a person looks around and he sees other uh, Jews that are observing Shabbat in their way and perhaps they're going to shul and perhaps they're having kiddush and they're eating but the the holiness of shabbat is sometimes lacking because there's not enough torah they're talking about business which is forbidden or they're just playing basketball which is problematic uh, uh, the issue of mukze with the ball for adults uh there's all types of issues where the holiness of shabbat is almost non-existent it's like it's just a literally a vacation from their work but not a vacation uh from uh, from the mundane uh so it's uh, important for a person to learn a lot of Torah if you're a uh, single if you're married if you have kids learning Torah on Shabbat is the uh is of utmost importance and uh, when you tell a person that uh, this is something that they need to do and it's beautiful if they're not already learning Torah they simply have no idea why this is good and there comes the uh, uh the obligation for us to teach uh them a reason of why they need to be afraid afraid of a kadosh baruch Hu, not because they're afraid of his majesty and his glory and his beauty and not because they're not loving hashem enough but rather afraid of outright punishment 
a punishment that every single person that has a working brain cell knows what it means a punishment of health crisis a punishment of 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 ma- of, of money matters marriage matters uh, uh children you know no one wants to uh get a phone call uh, and that has shalom that somebody that they love just died nobody wants to get a phone call that they just lost their biggest customer nobody wants to get a phone call that uh, their spouse doesn't want to be with them anymore with an un, un, uh uh, an unrealistic reason. Nobody wants to get those calls. Akadosh Baruch Hu says to us that when we observe the Shabbat the, and, and we keep it, we protect it, that Shabbat protects us from all of the different enemies that we have throughout the whole week. And when a person understands that there is an extraordinary punishment, not just in Genom that they don't even know about yet, and, and the fire and, and all the horrible things that happen there, but rather there's a punishment in this world. You're simply putting yourself in the same status as an animal when you do not observe Shabbat. Now, of course, some of the uh, uh, righteous Noahides uh, hear this and they want to keep Shabbat also. And we've told them many times in the name of the Rambam and many other uh, Chachamim, that a non-Jew is not allowed to observe Shabbat. You're allowed to take vacation from your work, you're allowed to eat a special meal, but to observe Shabbat like a Jew does, lighting the candles, doing Kiddush, all of those things, it's not allowed for a non-Jew, simply because this is a gift that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave to Am Yisrael as one of the three things in the Torah that is called a covenant between Hashem and Am Yisrael. So therefore, a, a non-Jew that wants to observe Shabbat, either they have to be uh they have to uh, convert or they simply have to understand that they're going to get punished for what they're doing that's it's as simple as it gets now only a fool would say oh yeah i'm gonna do that and uh it's okay if i get punished that means that you're not observing shabbat because you love hashem you're observing shabbat because you love yourself so it's important for a person to know the truth and sometimes that truth hurts because it doesn't fit with our existing reality with our existing beliefs and there comes some of these unique laws that are in the Torah where the Torah tells us that yes there are certain things that are logical there are certain things that are illogical but therefore but thereby either one they're acceptable to you because you like them it fits your uh, uh, your mentality your lifestyle to let's say to eat kosher you understand it because in your mind it's healthier spiritually and physically uh observing shabbat it, it makes sense to you why because yeah it's a time to uh connect to hashem even further and with the family and everything else to uh to not murder people yeah sure i like that one i don't want anybody to murder me i don't want to murder them and there's certain things that make sense to people but chachamim always tell us that there are certain laws that are not going to make sense whatsoever but yet we have to learn them we have to learn them and we have to accept them but nonetheless the Torah Kedusha tells us several of them in this parasha and gives us a few examples of certain things so first and foremost we start off Parashat Naso with the uh, continuation of the census the census that uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded Moshe Rabbeinu and the reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded Moshe Rabbeinu to uh, uh uh to do a census to count how many jewish people uh between uh the ages of 20 until the age of 60 we have and also later on how many levites uh you know from from uh, uh that are up to uh age 30 and so on all these different details akadosh Baruch Hu commanded us uh commanded moshe rabbeinu uh to do it simply because and he'd done it several times in the torah Rashi says he said he did it because he wants to show us how much he loves us just like a person that likes money likes to look at his portfolio every day likes to look at his bank account every day even though he knows nothing changed likes to uh you know he likes to get attention so he looks at his email every two seconds he likes to know what's going on in the world because he thinks that he's running the world so he likes to look at the social media every 30 seconds when you like something you look at it constantly and then that unfortunately can become a bad addiction Akadosh Baruch Hu is addicted to Am Yisrael he loves Am Yisrael and he says I want to count you because you're my jewels you're you're my chosen people I want to count you I want to count you and each one another one yeah I already knew I had that one but I want to count it again because it reminds me of all the beautiful things that I love about this one person and this tzaddik and that tzaddikah and look she has a kisui rosh and yeah I knew she had a kisui rosh but uh, again 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 that's how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves us the question is why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu do it on his own why do we why does Moshe Rabbeinu 
need to uh, get commanded by Kadosh Baruch to count Am Yisrael, especially since Moshe Rabbeinu is Isha Elokim, he's the, he's the only one that's called in the Torah, the man of God. Uh, surely uh, he spoke to Hashem face to face, he knows the will of Hashem, he knows better than anybody else that Hashem loves Am Yisrael. So if you already know that uh, Hashem loves Am Yisrael, and you know he likes to count them, just go ahead and count them every day. No. That's not allowed. Why? Because then, once you count something, you open up the uh, the, the gates of Ainara, evil eye, evil eye. And the Gemara says that evil eye is not only real; it is deadly. So much so that the Gemara says that out of a thousand people that die, nine hundred and ninety-nine die from Ainara, from evil eye. People don't like to see other people have something that they want, or they don't like to simply see other people happy when they're not. And evil eye is very much real, and of course. A person needs to understand that this is one of the reasons. It's one of the reasons why Chizkiyahu HaMelech, Chizkiyahu was a Ish Kodesh, Kodesh Kodeshim, got all of Am Yisrael to do tshuva, so much so that they couldn't, fa- they couldn't find a young six-year-old that didn't know the most intricate details of the Torah about purity and impurity. Unbelievable level of Torah was existed at the time of Chizkiyahu after he commanded all of Am Yisrael to go and learn Torah or get killed. Literally, that was the that was the decree. He put a sword in the ground, said, whoever learns Torah will live. Whoever doesn't, gets the sword instead. And that sword to go fight for us. We don't need an army. We have a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And that's why when Sancheriv, Sancheriv, the most powerful king at the time, had the biggest army, came with over 180,000 uh, uh, general soldiers, literally a massive army that could have literally spit and drowned Yerushalayim, already conquered a, uh, a large part of the world, came with all of his army. Chizkiyahu was not worried for even a second. He simply told the Kadosh Baruch I'm going to sleep. You take care of this. You told me if I learn Torah, if I get Am Yisrael to go learn Torah, you're going to take care of the wars. I'm going to sleep. That's what he did. This is in the Tanakh. Chizkiyahu went to sleep. Akadosh Baruch Hu says, you're right. He sent Malach Gavriel with his huge hands, Trach, and destroyed all of the soldiers. All of the soldiers of a... Uh, of uh, of San Kharibi Machshim of Ezikho. Now, of course, the behind the scenes is is that Akadosh Baruch Hu wanted to make Chizkiyahu Mashiach and San Kharib, he wanted to make him into Gog. But there was a little bit of a mistake. There was a little bit of an issue there. Part of the uh, part of the mistake was that Chizkiyahu, after he got a special miracle from Akadosh Baruch Hu, that practically resurrected him because he got really uh, 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 sick to the point where he was on his deathbed when he realized that it's because he made a mistake because he didn't get married uh, and uh, therefore HaKadosh Baruch Hu was in essence uh, punishing him. Immediately he did tshuva, immediately he got married to the daughter of Isaiah the prophet and HaKadosh Baruch Hu made a miracle for him to show him that he accepts his tshuva by stopping the sun in a, and reversing it actually and holding it in the middle of the sky, this miracle was clear to everyone, not just the Jewish people, even the Goim, that this was a special miracle that was made for Chizkiyahu. That's how holy he was. He's one of four people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu stopped the sun in its place, in essence, reversed it uh, as a special uh, sign of, uh, of uh, how much he loves him. But Chizkiyahu made a mistake after this. After this miracle was publicized, he was visited by different people, and one of the uh, Gentile uh, kings uh, from Babylon that came to visit him, Chizkiyahu, showed him everything. Showed him all the things, showed him the places, the, the things that HaKadosh uh, Baruch Hu gave. Oh, look, he gave us gold, he gave us silver, he gave us the Bet HaMikdash, he gave us this, he gave us that. All of these different things, Hashem Echem, even the Midrash says that he showed him his wife. So things that uh, he wanted to show the blessings. He thought it's a good thing. Kadosh Baruch Hu says, no, I didn't say to go show the people everything. Who said you're going to show people that how successful you are in the stock market? Who said you should show people how much money you made? Who said you were supposed to show people how beautiful your wife is? Like people come up to you and say, look, 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 I just got married. Look how beautiful my wife is. Who are you showing? If you're showing it to your mother, Baruch Hashem. But you're showing it to your friend? You're showing it to some, some stranger? Why? Why? Or people like to post pictures of their kids on the internet oh look how cute my kids is look 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 every day is a new picture it's cute but it's not a good idea why Ainara? Ainara. 
And of course, a person could say, yeah, no, no, I'm like uh, Yosef and Tzadik. I don't believe in Ayin Ara. Gemara Masechet Brachot says, if you do a certain thing, you say that with your hands, and you say that you are from the descendants of, uh, of Yosef and Tzadik, and therefore Ayin Ara is not going to uh, affect you. Chazaku Baruch. But do you really? Do you really believe that? Or the second that you have a flat tire on the way to an appointment, you say, ah, somebody must have put an Ayin Ara on me. The point being is, there's no reason. There's no reason to show and tell. There's no reason to show off. It's never a good idea. It's also very, very good to teach kids not to show off, not to show off to their brothers and sisters, not to show off to their friends. Yes, you have a new toy, no problem. You could enjoy your new toy. You don't have to say, oh, I got this new thing, this new thing. Look, I have it and you don't have it. These are not good things. These are not good things. And I know it's obvious to teach little kids, but sometimes we have to teach ourselves because as soon as a person gets a brand new car or gets a brand new house or gets a brand new anything, Thing, immediately they want to tell the whole world look i got brand new this and i'm going here and i'm going there why what do you get out of it what do you get out of it other than people's evil eye and jealousy what do you get out of it nothing at that moment when he showed the babylonian king his uh, uh his his stuff what was happening all the treasures akadosh Baruch who says you show them that and i swear to you that one day they're gonna take all of it and that's exactly what happened when nebuchadnezzar came years later and Hashem Yerachem took everything, everything, emptied out everything. He, he, he took so much that literally they emptied out the gold from the Bet Mikdash. When they took out all the gold from the Bet Mikdash from Yerushalayim, there was such an abundance of gold. The, uh, the Midrash says there was such an abundance of gold now in, available in the market that the price of gold collapsed. That's how much they took. That's how much the Am Yisrael had. And we lost it for what? Showing and telling. Yeah, but it's a bracha. It's a blessing. Blessing are best kept in hiding. It's also why my, my Rav and what I, what I also teach my students, whoever calls themselves my students and actually shares their personal stuff with us, anytime the uh, young ladies tell me that the Baruch Hashem, them and their husband are blessed, they're pregnant, when should we tell everybody? I simply say, what my Rav told me. When? when you have no other choice in so many words keep it hidden for as long as possible because blessings are best uh, are best kept in uh, in hiding you don't need to lie about it simply there's no reason to publicize it there's no reason to tell facebook and twitter and TikTok and pickpock and all these stupid things that are out there that you're pregnant or, or that you got a raise or there's just simply no benefit whatsoever in sharing the good news that you have simply no why because as you already know most people are not going to be happy for you they're not and even the ones that say oh mazal tov yeah they're saying mazal tov to sound like a nice cordial decent human being but in reality their heart says something else how come i don't have that oh she just got married Psh, i think i know him i think he's better for me than for her oh he just got married she's cute i date her and all of a sudden people have all types of wicked thoughts in their mind oh how come hashem gave him and not me oh this and that and what do you need this in your life you have a blessing keep it hidden how long as long as you can surely you shouldn't tell anybody that you're pregnant other than your spouse for the first three months that's already a given it's already a given how much further the minhag that I learned from Rabbi Ephraim, and I saw it in, in other tzaddikim that I've known, is literally they keep it a secret for as long as possible. In some cases, some women, their, their body doesn't change very much, and they literally keep it secret for like seven months. By the time the family uh, finds out about it, it's like, uh, okay, listen, it's next month. Sometimes, if you can, you should. If you can, you should. At times, there are exceptions made. There are exceptions made if there's a certain amount of sadness in the family, there's a death in the family, you want to do kibbut avaim, uh, you know, your parents are very sad, or it's the, the, yeah. there are certain exceptions that are made that you can do it. It's not a problem, but again, even when you tell your ima and your abba, uh, uh, tell them, don't tell anybody. I'm telling you, but we don't want to tell anybody else. I'll tell you, but not anybody else. And you hope that they don't tell anybody else. It's very hard for them to keep that secret because again not everybody's always on the same page the point being is is that you have certain things in the torah that are clear and everybody understands them now the torah here is telling us that there are certain things that are unique we're going to go over at least a couple of them that are in this week's parasha 
uh, now that we've taken up most, most of our time. And one of the things that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu is, a, is, is, is told here is that you can't do the census on your own. You have to be conscious of the fact that there's Ainara. There's Ainara. Ainara, this evil eye, can come not just from your enemies. It could even come from your friends. It could come even from your loved ones. It could even come from yourself. Literally, a person can give Ainara to themselves. Gives himself a pat on the back. He just made $100,000 last month in some investment. And that's good for me. Great. Huh? Eh? Next thing you know, next month he lost 150. What happened? Could be. Could be. Not necessarily always, but it could be Ainara. Of course, this is assuming that a person is not causing certain, you know, a harm to himself by wasting seed, violating Shabbat, and, and not learning Torah, not having Shlom Bait, certain things that clearly are things that cause losses but the point being is is that Ainara is one of the first things that we learn already the second thing that we see is that in this census we learn something unique something that the Rambam clarifies for us where the Torah tells us in chapter 4 that uh, uh, in uh, in verse 30 chapter 4 verse number uh, 30 uh, from uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu talks about the different types of Kwanim, who, what, when, and how. And he says, you shall count them, everyone who comes to the legion to do the work of the oil moed. So, Onkelos, Onkelos Agel, Onkelos Agel Kadosh says, this is referring to everyone who comes to join the legion of the Leviim. Not just anyone that's coming to work at the oil moed, at the, at the Bet Mikdash of the wilderness, but this is referring to everyone that is coming to join the Leviim, the legion of the Leviim. And it's not a legion that is an army that's going to fight with, uh, with swords and knives and, and, and bombs. But this is the army of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Now, a person reads this for the first time and he says, okay, this is wonderful. I like to hear stories from 3,000 years ago. But how does this have anything to do with my life? Number one, I'm not a Levi. Number two, I don't have a bet to me that's that I can work in. Number three, why do I need to read this every single year? Okay, I read it one time in my life. Why do I need to read it? The Rambam writes in Ilchot Shemitah Ve'yovel, chapter 13, Alcha number 12 and 13. Why did the Levites not receive a portion of the inheritance of Eretz Yisrael and the spoils of war like their brethren? because they were set aside to serve God and minister unto him and to instruct people at large in his just path and righteous judgments. As the Torah says in Sefer Dvarim in Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 10, they will teach your judgments to Yaakov and your Torah to Israel, and therefore they were set apart from all of the ways of the world. They do not wage war like the remainder of the Jewish people, nor do they receive an inheritance nor do they acquire for themselves through their physical power. Instead, they are God's legion. As it states, uh, God has blessed his legion and he provides for them. In uh, Numbers chapter 18, verse 20, and also, I am your portion and your inheritance. So in Alcha number 12, uh, uh, the Rambam clarifies, hey, this legion is not an army that is an army with weapons, but rather it's an army of Hashem. These are the rabbis. These are the Talmidei Chachamim. These are the people that uh, are going to not only learn Torah and serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but also serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu by teaching Torah. So still the person says, okay, great. I understand. It's wonderful. They're special people. I'm still not a Levi and it still don't have a Bet HaMikdash. So therefore you have to continue reading Alacha number 13. Not only is the tribe of, of Levi but any one of the inhabitants of the world whose spirit generously motivates him and he understands with his wisdom to set himself aside and stand before God to serve him and minister to him and to know God, proceeding justly as God made him, removing from his neck the yoke of the many reckonings which people seek, he is sanctified as holy of holies, Kodesh Kodeshim. God will be his portion and heritage forever, and will provide what is sufficient for him in this world like he provides for the priests and for the Levites, for the Kohanim and the Levim. And thus King David declares in Psalm chapter 16, verse 5, God is the lot of my portion. 
you are my cup you support my lot in so many words the rambam is in essence telling us who are the levim that are being referenced here it's not just the tribe of levi but in fact anyone today that is learning torah and that is their primary vocation that is their primary concern that is their primary aspiration this is what they want to do and they're not just learning it for their own sake they're learning it for the sake of also teaching others these holy avachim we have in the kolal what our organization as a whole does doing cube teaching people that don't know anything teaching people that do know a lot but need extra chizuk teaching people different things that to get them closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this is in essence the what the Rambam says this makes you just like the Levim a special legion of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. so a person that is concerned about the protection of Am Yisrael instead of them following the Zionist mentality that tells people go and join some army go and uh, uh, invent a new weapon you don't need weapons to fight against Akadosh Bahu's enemies. You need more Torah. The more Torah that you have in the world, the less you'll actually need weapons. And the beautiful part is, is that anyone can do it. The more you commit, the more you commit to the Torah, as this is my primary focus in life. This is all I want to do. Either Torah that you're learning and, and, and teaching, Torah that you're getting people to learn and to teach. This is what makes a person part of that special unique legion of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. so again first we saw something that seems from the surface not really relevant to your average person now we see that it can be relevant if the person makes that choice in so many words you can be part of that special legion if you choose to be you don't need to have a special merit you don't need to have special yichus as far as who your father is and how you were brought up and what yeshiva you made simple it's a decision you make today now of course many times people they start watching the shirim they like it they start observing certain mitzvot and they figure that okay i'm gonna learn torah i'm gonna watch my shirim for a couple of hours a day i'm gonna go work uh you know at, at cvs and at walmart and, and and go sell diamonds and go cut hair and go do all these different things and Baruch Hashem, I, I, I'm, I'm learning this is wonderful now can that person that's living a regular life that he can't study torah all day he can't teach torah all day but he wants to be part of this special legion he wants to be part of this special legion but he knows he cannot abandon his career uh you know in, in some factory uh because he doesn't have he doesn't have the tools can he be part of that legion yes he can why just like the rambam explained a person that is 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 uh, is, is committing himself to serving a kadosh Bahu to bring this torah outwards to bring it out there that's a person that is part of that legion so what does a person do simply you may not be able to learn torah all day surely you need to learn some you need to learn a few hours a day you need to learn as much as possible but you can turn what you're doing as far as your vocation your work into something that is connected to the Torah how simple you take a piece of the money that you make and you invest it in your number one investment in life and that's into the world of Torah you take on yourself to go and sponsor one or two or three Avrechim each month you take on uh, on yourself to go and sponsor X amount of money into helping people do tshuva and to helping people uh, 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 that are doing kiruv. You go and you invest a good portion of your money on a regular basis, not in some 401k or in some retirement that you may or may not ever see, but rather you invest it into the world of Torah, but of course Torah that works. And this is one of the things that a person does need a special merit to have where there are plenty of donations that are made but unfortunately very few of them end up in the right places that people think and we've talked about this many times we have even a whole shiur about it that we did several months ago so we're not going to go over it again the point is that a person needs to find themselves a a, a, a righteous torah institution whether it's a kolel or a kirov organization or its name is bezat hashem <laughs> or whatever you want to call it the key is to make that your priority now of course a person could say listen can i dabble can i diversify sure if you are so smart and so uh 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 uh, uh 
fortunate that you know of multiple organizations that you really know are true Torah organizations, by all means, you can diversify. The problem is that people think that diversifying their, 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 uh, their tzedakah is always a good thing. And it's not necessarily so. And the reason why is because you have to look at your tzedakah the same way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is structuring this week's parasha. He's telling each one of Bnei Israel here that they have a specific job. He tells Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron Kohen, go and tell each one of the tribes. And not only each one of the tribes, each one of the families within the tribes, that they have a specific job to do and only that job. They can't go and help each other in somewhere else. The one that's responsible for picking up, let's say, the, uh, the, the Tachash skin that's covering the, uh, 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 the, the Mishkan from the uh, uh, Kehat family, he can't just decide, you know what, I don't feel like doing this today. I'm going to go help my buddy over there that's taking care of the poles. And the one that's taking care of the poles says, you know what, the poles... Uh, it's not for me today. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go help some of the Levim that are going inside the Kodesh Kodeshim over there with the table, with the cool stuff over there, the menorah. I'm going to go help them out. Looks like they need a hand. You can't do that. It's not, there's no permission to do that. In fact, the only job you're allowed to do is the job that a Kadosh Baruch Hu gave you. Why? Because you have, just like everyone understands logically, that for a business to succeed, everyone has to have a certain role yes if you're an entrepreneur you have a small business you at times have to wear multiple hats but everyone knows for that business to 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 succeed there has to be a primary hat there has to be one major role that only you can do and no one else can and it's the the more successful a business is the more they have certain people that are not simply dispensable many employees and in fact most employees are disposable because their 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 task can easily be replaced by somebody else not necessarily because the task is easy but simply because they themselves are doing just the minimum they're not adding any special thing to it that's their unique touch that makes them uh, a, a, a a really big uh, success for the company they just do they just fulfill the minimum and therefore anytime there's cutbacks or anytime there's a better opportunity for a company they look for all of the disposable employees to cut first they're not going to go cut the uh, the major people that are the rainmakers of the company they're always going to look at the people that are disposable but Needless to say, those key people, either they're executives or managers or, or, or rainmakers, special salesmen, people that are unique within a, uh, within a company, they are tasked with that job. Now, yes, of course, you're tasked with that job. You're dealing with, uh, I don't know, some type of uh, chemicals and you have to be responsible for that chemical. But of course, if there's a little bit of garbage on the floor, you can pick that up too. If somebody forgot to lock the door, you could do that too. But that's not your primary task. That's not your primary task. And everyone understands that that type of uh, 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 process is necessary for a business to succeed, big or small. A Kadosh Baruch Hu says it's even more important in the world of Torah. It's even more important in the world of Torah. Each one of the tribes... And each one of the families within the tribes were tasked with specific, unique tasks that only they can do. No one else can help them. They cannot help anybody else. You have to make all of your energy, all of your focus on this one particular thing. Now, if a person focuses their, their, their life today and not just their business, but also their servitude of Hashem and how they contribute, how they donate, where they pray, what they do in one particular place that they're fortunate enough to find that's helping them, that's inspiring them, that's helping others and so on. And they can make that their primary investment more times than not. That's going to be much more successful in their Olam Abba and in, in their Olam Azeh than spreading themselves very thinly. And the reason why is because, again, even though everybody means well and even though it seems like everybody's doing uh, doing good things not everything is the same not all investments are the same some investments can only generate two or three or four percent a year some investments have the potential to make 40 or 50 percent some investments can triple or quadruple your money some investments are you know not investments but they're guaranteed losses 
A person needs to look at their servitude of Hashem as what is going to yield me the biggest result. Where can I make the most amount of spiritual profit as, as, as I invest this money? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't care about what you like and what you don't like and what looks good for the community or what doesn't look good for the community. Because if something looks good for the community but is bad for the, the world of Hashem, then of course this is not the will of Hashem. This is also where Kadosh Baruch Hu also tells us in this week's parasha, in chapter 5, verse number 3, that uh, uh, he, he reminds us that Mizachar ad Nekeva teshalchu el michutz lemachanet teshalchum velo itmau et machanem asher ani shochem betocham. The uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, male and female alike, shall you send away to the outside of the camp, shall you send them away so that they should not contaminate their camps in which I dwell. People that have contracted a certain type of impurity have to be kicked out of the camp. Some have to be kicked out of everything if they have a uh, uh, tzarat because of Lashon Ara and other things that cause tzarat, they're kicked out of the whole camp. It's a horrific sin and therefore requires a horrific uh, punishment. Some people have a different uh, type of contamination and they're only kicked out of the uh, camp of the Shekhinah. Some have a uh, different type of sin and they're uh, kicked out uh, of uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, everything except the Israelite camp. The point being is, is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that this applies both to males and females. And then he tells us the children of Israel, the children of Israel were commanded. So Onkelos says, male and female alike, you shall you send away. To the outside of the camp shall you send them. And it says, uh, children of Israel did so. They sent them away to the outside of the camp as Hashem had spoken to, with Moshe. So did the children of Israel do. Why does the Torah have to remind us that Am Israel did this? That yes, when it was males and females that were contaminated, they fulfilled the will of Hashem and kicked them out of the camp. Because the Torah knows that we have emotions. And sometimes those emotions tell us otherwise. Oh, yeah, I know what Torah says, kick out the male and female out of the camp when they're contaminated, and obviously it's because they did something bad, and as a result, they got this. I get it, but when I accepted it, I didn't know that it was going to apply to my family. I didn't know it's going to apply to my friend. I didn't know it's going to apply to my husband. I didn't know. I said, yeah, I'll do it, but I didn't know it's going to apply to me. So what happens here? Am Yisrael is noted here. Is noted here as in essence a, 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 a banner of, of, of how proud HaKadosh Baruch Hu is of Am Yisrael that he says Am Yisrael did this even though those males and females sometimes were their brothers their sisters their parents their spouse their best friend their neighbor when they were contaminated Am Yisrael followed the Torah despite their emotional bias and kicked them out of the camp and kicked them out of the camp so the point being is is that when you have when you have a torah as your primary navigation system you have to understand that sometimes that navigation system is not necessarily going to agree with your logic or with your emotions and a person needs to know that at times you're going to have the emotional attachment to contribute to a place that supports heresy to a place that supports uh things that are against the torah and if a person wants to uh, look at things from the their own personal best interest, which is what Hashem wants, they can't look at it from where they have an emotional attachment. They have to look at it, where am I going to make the most amount of spiritual profit? So if I have one place that's a local community, that's good, it's wonderful, but listen, this local community has some, uh, the, the rabbi there, he's been here for 30 years, and... After 30 years, I can tell you that he has 15 people, uh, 16 people praying with him, and uh, nine of them don't even keep Shabbat. Now, this is a place that it would be stupid to invest in. Why? Because it's not like it's a new place, and you just started this 15 people, and you don't really know what kind of results the rabbi can bring. After 30 years, that's it. This is He's supposed to be at the peak of his uh, performance already at this point. If he hasn't made the community do tshuva by now, it's pretty much never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Yeah, but he does nice things. 
great i'm not saying all he does is bad but you have to look at it from your own portfolio your own spiritual portfolio to see where will i make the most amount of spiritual profit and doing otherwise is not only stupid but it's also against the torah it's akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want us to invest where our hearts lead us uh, where it's uh, the the uh, the community will be proud of us no he wants us to invest in the place that's the most profitable why because it's the most profitable because that's what he wants it's the most profitable because it yields the most amount of honor to akadosh Baruch Hu. to go help people do tshuva real tshuva to transform their life to go help people learn torah non-stop to go help more uh righteousness spread into the world that's where our kadosh Buhu gets the most amount of honor that's where there's the most glory of god not in that lowly rinky dink community that uh delivers challah to their community once a month but everybody drives on shabbat no that's not where our kadosh Buhu's name is being honored that's where people maybe are getting fat from challah that's maybe where people are buying more and more buildings that's where maybe there's a lot of things that are helping people uh, fulfill their own personal desires but a kadosh Baruch whose name is not being sanctified there where is hashem's being name being sanctified in a place where there's non-stop torah in a place where there's a lot of people transforming their life continuously to get closer and closer to hashem and are being told the truth they're not being enabled to continue being sinners they're being told the truth in order to serve Hashem even more despite how religious they already are now this of course means that there are going to be some people in the community that are religious already for a while and are continuing to look to grow and it's going to be some people that are not religious and that community is going to try to help all of them get closer and closer to Hashem you don't reject everybody you don't reject anybody unless they're heretics that are looking to stay heretics and to cause other people to be heretics but if people are genuinely looking to get closer to Hashem whether they're religious or not should never be a reason of why you accept them into your community or not whether Ashkenazim, Sfaradim, they're Litaim, they're uh, Hasidim that stuff never matters HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants his name to be spread everywhere everywhere meaning that it the full name the full truth is being spread to the highest level and a person that thinks about it wait a minute i can invest my money in a place that is literally concerned more about the honor of god than their own bottom line their own uh, house their own well-being they care about hashem's name or i can invest in another place that perhaps has a nice newsletter maybe uh makes a, a nice event once or twice a year uh the rabbi looks like he's uh doing pretty good uh, financially but as far as how many people actually did uh, tshuva uh non-existent as far as how many uh people have transformed their life very little uh you know but a person needs to know you have to invest your money where there's the most glory for god that's really where it is now of course there are always opportunities to not only help people spiritually but also help them physically help the poor even when it comes to helping the poor a person needs to know there is a priority list there is an investment here why if you help the general poor of the world surely it's a good thing surely it's a nice thing but it's not necessarily always profitable why if you help the general poor and those general poor community are anti-god anti-torah idol worshipers in many cases you're not exactly getting a real uh, serious reward for that you're just simply feeding the next hitler you're feeding the next uh, 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 uh rapist but if you take that very same amount of money and you invest in people that are already glued to hashem already have decided that hashem is their priority in life and that's why they made certain career choices and certain marriage choices and certain living choices and you take that money and you help those poor people that are avrechim that are bnei torah that are that are seriously uh committed to akadosh baruch Hu. i don't have to explain and elaborate of how there's a difference in profit between one and another in one case you may end up generating more losses than profits because they're anti-torah or they're simply careless about the truth and in another place you have people that their life is a profit for the world because if they're able to eat 
and they're able to feed their kids, that means that they're now able to learn more Torah. And guess what? That also goes to your merit. That also goes to that spiritual profit that you're trying to yield. So again, it's, it's always good to do good, but a person needs to be clever, just like we learned from this parasha, where HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, everyone has to be very, very uh, 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 clear about what is their role in life. Because many times a person can start in a good place, they have good contributions, good investments, everything is good, but then they decide, listen, I, uh, I already donated enough, let me go and start something else. And they decide to go do something else. And they don't realize what kind of tragedy they brought onto themselves by making it. Not necessarily that they're going to get punished for, for stopping, but many times where, where they the place that inspired them to transform their life was not only something that blessed them to transform their life, but it's something that is creating a whole new world for them in Olam Abba and in Olam Azay. It's bringing them a lot of blessings. And then they decide, listen, I've contributed to this place for two or three or four years or 10 years. It's time to go and uh, help someone else. And that someone else may be good, but it's not the place that you uh, that you started. And what ends up happening is that they literally go from something that is yielding them a million percent returns per day in profit to a place that's giving them 10 percent returns now of course it seems like well it's still profit yes only a stupid person would think that if you realize what a million percent return is versus 10 percent you realize this is a world of difference this is like somebody that invests into an avrech versus a person that invests into that that's called uh uh, uh ovadia yosef and a person that's investing into a rishon letzion ovadia yosef why it's a very big difference if you invested in ovadia yosef when he was an avrech when nobody knew him and you invested into that even if you're investing into him 30 years later after he's already world-renowned famous you're still yielding that same extraordinary result that you got from the beginning. On the other hand, you're investing into Rav Ovadi Yosef, Rishon Etzion, the whole world knows about him, and you decide, yeah, I'm going to write a check to him, the, the, the number one rabbi in the world, I'm going to write a check for a million dollars to him. Sure, it's good, but it's nowhere near the same thing. Why? Results are amazing. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants you to invest into something that not the whole world is already on. He wants you to invest into something that's yielding the most amount of fruits, the most profitable thing. Now, of course, there's going to be a lot more profit made from the revolution that Rav Ovadia made on his way to the top, much more than what he's uh, able to do when he's already at the peak. Needless to say, a person needs to look at every single one of the dollars that comes into their pocket and leaves their pocket as what do I want with this dollar? What do I want with this yen? What do I want with this euro? Or what do I want with this shekel? What do I want with it? Do I want it to just simply be something that is just going to feed my belly, feed my ego, feed my lust? Or do I want this dollar to be something that is going to yield me endless profits because I'm going to invest it to glorify Hashem's name? So, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us here that a person needs to be very, very particular about where they invest. And don't make the mistake in thinking that you are a, uh, 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 a philanthropist by spreading out your, your blessing into many places because you're already fortunate enough if you have one place that's actually a legitimate good place, needless to say, if you have two. It's, it's there are very, very few, very, very few organizations that a person is fortunate enough to actually be a, a substantial investor in that's actually, uh, that's actually going to yield real returns. So a person needs to know that they have to be smart. They have to be smart. This, again, is not a, uh, 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 something that is uh, uncommon in the, the, the world of Torah, but it is uncommon in, the, in society today because, again, people tend to make their, uh, their donations and their so-called spiritual investments based on certain interests that are not necessarily always for the uh for the uh, for the for the betterment of uh of hashem's name and the glorification of hashem's name more like the betterment of their own name and the betterment of their standing in society 
this does not yield any good results in the end you have to make sure that you invest wisely invest wisely this is the next thing i think we have a little bit more time and uh we'll go into the next unique mitzvah the next unique mitzvah that we have that we learn in uh in this parasha is that we have the mitzvah of the sota the sota where it says uh the bear of israel this is in chapter uh, uh five uh, verse number uh, 11 and on so here we have the whole uh, 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 story in the whole uh, uh, teachings of the Isha Asota. What is the Isha Asota? Isha Asota is a wayward woman that is suspected of being an adulteress. She's not known for sure, but she made enough bad decisions that she's now suspected of committing adultery on her husband. And uh, here we have a connection to one of the other things that this uh, parasha said in the same chapter but verse number eight where akadosh Baruch Hu says that uh when he was talking about a man and a woman that will not commit uh who will commit from among the many uh, sins of man and uh, by committing falsehood Rashi says this falsehood is also connecting to being a sota. Why is it false to being a sota? Well, for obvious reasons, if she already cheated on her husband, she committed adultery, then obviously that's falsehood. But Rashi says, no, no, even before you know whether she is a uh, committed adultery or not, she's already a uh, uh, guilty of committing falsehood. She's already guilty of committing falsehood. And that's the reason why she, even if, she doesn't end up getting the death penalty in the end because she didn't actually uh, 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 commit the actual sin itself of, of, of intimacy with, uh, with a, uh, a man that's not a husband. Still, she goes through a punishment process. In fact, Onkilo says over here that uh, Akadosh Baruch Hu is telling Moshe and Aaron, speak to the children of Israel and say to them that any man whose wife will go astray from the ways of modesty and commit falsehood against him by associated with another man and a man will possibly have lain with her a lying seed but it will be hidden from her husband's eyes and he suspects her because she becomes secluded with another man and she is possibly defiled but there's no witness against her who uh, who testifies that she actually committed adultery and she has not been seized against her will so now the torah is telling us that a woman is married jewish woman is married and she has violated the torah how did she violate the torah by violating the laws of yichud and secluding herself with another man that other man can be her cousin it could be her co-worker it could be her boss it could be some strange guy from the store and she decides to go into a room with him doesn't necessarily need to have a bed it doesn't necessarily need to be in a house it could be in an office it could be in different it could be even in her own house and she secludes herself in that room and no one really knows what happened in there no one has a uh, 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 a proof that she actually laid with that man because even though for uh for for the law to be uh, uh for her to get punished there has to be proof for sure that she made that sin and you typically need two witnesses to 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 tell you that in this particular case even if there is only one witness that says yeah i saw her actually commit the act with this guy she's forever forbidden to a husband she doesn't he doesn't even bring it to the coin that's it they're immediately divorced they immediately 
done but that's after she was warned after she's warned don't do it and she she ignores her husband and there's a witness that sees uh or even if she wasn't warned but uh, there's a witness that sees that she uh she laid with another man even if it's one that says she's forbidden to her husband now if there's two witnesses then uh you know, it's, it's the end of the story but what happens if there's no witnesses and we're now we're living in a time where there's no cameras uh that are uh digital cameras that you buy for three hundred dollars no here the only camera is a kadosh Baruch Hu. so the torah says our husband warned her not to be secluded with this uh with uh, with any man with this man and she ignores him and she's secluded with him again and after that her husband really doesn't know what's right or left he doesn't know if she cheated on him or if not all he knows is that she's being disrespectful and all he knows is that she already violated the Torah even if she didn't commit the actual act final act with this other man by violating the laws of modesty and, and by secluding herself with this other man they were not only working in the same company and they were not only working in the same office but they closed the door and nobody else was able to enter and there's only two of them this is a very serious problem even if he's our boss and even if he is a uh, cousin it's a very serious problem this is also sometimes what a lot of people don't know is that if let's say there's a second marriage or there's a marriage where somebody brings kids into the marriage they have to know that the laws of Yichud apply to them also meaning that child that you have from a different woman he is let's say a 16 17 year old boy he can't stay home with your new wife in the house and you're on some trip to uh, some other country for a few days you have a very serious problem there we had a uh a, a, a young student and said listen i uh you know i go and i uh visit my uh grandparents uh often and uh because i work near where they live and uh sometimes you know my uh, my grandfather does a lot of business and he uh and, and he travels sometimes i stay at his house and uh you know he leaves for a couple of days and i'm left in his house for let's say for the week but I'm only there with uh, with his new wife. She's not my grandmother. Am I allowed to do it? I said absolutely not. Why? First of all, she's not your grandmother. You have laws of Yehud there. Not allowed to be there. Now you don't have to go tell him. Listen, Grandpa, I can't do it. No, stay quiet. Just find yourself a different place. You don't have to make a whole big deal out of it. You don't have to do a whole show out of it. Tell him, oh, I'm sinning. No, no. Simply, you realize you're not allowed to do it. You realize that your grandfather or whoever is, is is not gonna be at the house okay you're not gonna be at the house either you're not gonna be at the house either you're gonna go sleep somewhere else go find yourself a hotel go find yourself a different house bottom line is don't put yourself in that circumstance male or female but now if the female does it in the times of the Torah here and there's no witnesses of what happened she has to go and be brought to the Kohen now the end result perhaps many of us have already heard that after they go through the whole procedure at the Bet HaMikdash with the Kohen Gadol takes her and tries to convince her to admit that she committed a crime that she really did lay with this man and if she refuses to uh, admit it either because she really didn't or because she's afraid of what the consequences would be then the last step is that he gives her this special bitter waters that the uh, uh the uh, onkelos calls the water the bitter water that causes curse not the the cursed water but the water the bitter water that causes curse what cause what what's the difference if they're cursed water then you're giving her something that's uh, that's bad for her but these are not bad waters these waters have the name of a kadosh Baruch Hu in them they only cause the curse that's inside you if you let that curse inside you meaning if this other strange man's seed is inside you it'll cause that curse to come out by in essence blowing you up and you're gonna die now this is not because uh anyone wants to curse you this is because you brought the curse onto yourself now this is the last step this is the last step that if she cheated on her husband and she doesn't want to admit it and she gets to the final step and she drinks this special water 
she dies on the spot what happens the, the water ends up fulfilling the uh the uh the words of the kohen which he says that if you did uh, 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 cheat on your husband, these waters that cause a curse shall enter your innards to cause your innards to distend and your thighs to disintegrate and the woman shall say amen, amen. Meaning, I'm telling you what's going to happen if you cheated on your husband. These waters will bring that curse out, expose it. You're going to blow up and die. And... Before you drink it, say amen, meaning that you agree to these terms. Or you could simply admit you cheated, and that way you're not gonna drink the water, but also you're not gonna stay married. Because you're not allowed to stay married to your husband if you cheated on him. Not even if it's one time. Even if it's one time, even if it's like, oh, I was drunk. No such thing. You cheated on him, finished, end. So the key is is that the Quran is trying to do everything possible to eliminate killing this woman he doesn't want to kill this woman even though she made a sin it's a crime it's horrendous it's atrocious whatever you want to say she's still a daughter of god that he wants her to stay alive and therefore there's a whole process that if you go into the gemara masikh it's uh, page 15 and on goes through the whole process and one of the most shocking parts of this process is that the what happens is that initially the kohen walks her around the bet mikdash there are a bunch of people the whole community is there watching this it's not like a one-on-one thing or there's just her and her husband and maybe a few other rabbis the whole community is invited to watch this you're asking yourself why it's embarrassing exactly why should i embarrass her if i don't even know if she's a criminal yet wait one second not only does he walk her around and tire her out to try to say okay listen we're gonna keep walking come on tell me the truth did you cheat did you cheat did you cheat no 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 okay continues to walk her around tire her out tire her out she doesn't want to do it the gemara says after trying to talk tough to her trying to get her out of it trying to get the words out of it because she doesn't want to drink the water if you're already in this stage that your husband suspects you of doing it either you're married to a psychopath that's jealous for no reason or you committed a big crime now it says if she didn't commit the final crime then what happens our husband is a obviously he uh, is is he in a right or is he in a wrong conclusion is that actually he's still in the right he's still in the right not right about her cheating but her and right her violating the Torah why because she put herself in a situation by secluding herself with another man that in itself is a violation of the Torah she put herself in an immodest position she is it's like a woman today walks around immodest and she's surprised as a bunch of guys don't care that she's married she put herself in a position where she's flirting with all types of people and she's surprised that one of them asked her on a date even though she's married with kids a person can't put themselves in in a in a position and that that is in essence opening the doors for the satan to enter and then scream foul oh no i didn't mean that i was just kidding i was just being nice no no you have to understand you're immodest in speech in clothing and so on you are already committing a crime that even if you don't make the final crime you still actually get punished now of course if a woman did not make that final crime she does end up getting a some type of uh, a, uh, a blessing where if she wasn't able to bring kids Rabbi Akiva says she's not going to be able to bring a kid to the world if she was barren she's not able to bring a kid to the world but still even though you say well that's great she's able to bring a kid to the world she wasn't able to bring a kid but still you have to also know what the process is to get to that point that you realize that no normal woman would actually do this unless she did commit a crime meaning that that final step and that first step that i told you is not only all that it is the first step of trying to talk to her into it pressure her talk to her you know get the truth out of her without going through the final step that's the first step last step is drinking the water if she's guilty she dies she's not guilty she gets the blessing but nonetheless she's still considered a sinner why because she secluded herself 
Now, what's the middle process? There's two major things the Gemara says. One, and this is an order, is that after she is not convinced to tell the truth, he rips her shirt and exposes her chest to everybody that's there. The entire community. We're not talking about just ladies. We're not talking about just men. We're not talking about just a scholars laymen scholars everyone is there the whole community is there is watching this and not only is she already being spoken about in such a way and everybody says oh a possible adulteress sota 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 now they expose her private part expose her chest and that's not it after he does this he asks her again did you cheat on your husband did you commit the action did you lay with this other man if she still says no then he does the final step before the last step which is he takes her kisui rosh her mitpachat on her rosh there's no wigs back then he takes that mitpachat and he takes it off and he exposes her hair to everybody that's there now in our logic in the year 5782 2022 according to their calendar this seems illogical what do you mean shouldn't the horrible exposing our chest part be the last part even worse than the water no according to the Torah no why because Karim, the hair of a woman signifies more beauty than even other parts of her body so much so that it's considered her almost the highest level of nakedness aside from the last part that you already know a woman a married woman's hair seeing it is like seeing her private part it's more exotic it's more it's more uh, uh, horrendous to look at that than the other part not to allow the other parts to be looked at but to understand a kadosh whose mindset here is that he's telling you you put yourself in a bad situation you brought the embarrassment onto yourself by embarrassing your husband and embarrassing yourself with that act now you're going to go through a whole process even if you didn't lay with this man and the ultimate embarrassment is not even exposing the chest but rather exposing the hair why exposing the hair because when you secluded yourself with this strange man you acted like you were a single woman you didn't act like you were a mother of three children or four children you didn't act like you were married for the last few months you didn't act like you're a grandmother you didn't act like you were a bat israel that is connected to a ben israel you acted like you are just alone single lady looking for somebody to marry since you acted that way let the world see you that way and surely they can't see you that way if you have a kisui roshan because that's the number one sign of whether a lady is married or not number one way to know whether this lady is married or not is if she covers her hair more than anything else number one way to know if she's married or not she have a kisui roshan unfortunately today with our many sins we have many married ladies either not covering their hair at all or they walk around and you can't tell if they're covering their hair because their wig looks better and more real than their real hair and unfortunately as Rav Shvadron Rav Shvadron one of the greatest Chachamim in, in, in the, the world of, of, of jewelry in the last hundred years an extraordinary Mezakeh Rabim cried to his audience in Yerushalayim and says why do women want to look like the Sota it's not like they're emulating Sarai Menu. It's not like they're emulating the Chana. They're not emulating any of the Tzadikot. Who are they emulating? Who is the only one in the Torah that's mentioned? 
that shows her hair, the sota, the woman that's considered a wayward woman, even if she didn't lay with the man, that's not her husband. She's still considered a sota. Why? Because you acted like a single lady. Rav Shvadon asks, why do you want to look like this lady and show your hair? The number one sign of a married lady. Number one sign of a bat Israel that's married. Number one is covering your hair. It's even more. It's even more private. Your hair is even more private than your upper part of your body. So here we see Rabotai something completely against all logic of modern day. But the reality is, there's only a single truth. And that truth has been the same truth since HaKadosh Baruch Hu wrote it in the Torah. 974 generations before he created the world. That truth never changed, despite the times. As one of our 13 principles of faith is that the Torah does not change. The Torah does not change, regardless of what society today tells you. A Jewish woman must, that's married must cover her hair with a mitpachat, with a hat. She must cover her hair. To go around showing your hair to people is in essence antithetical, not only to the Torah, but to your own marriage. And although this may be the opposite of what your local community is telling you and what everybody apparently has an opinion about, it's been true for the last 974 generations before the world was created and since then. And it only started changing with society over the last couple of hundred years, especially the last 50 years. So if it was true for nearly a thousand generations, thousands of years, how can you say that that truth changed? without being an absolute heretic and saying that the Torah changed. The reality is, Rabbi Akadosh Baruch Hu commanded us to fulfill the Torah even when that Torah seems ancient, even when that Torah seems illogical, even when that Torah seems like it's against our interest. Because Akadosh Baruch Hu only created us to give us good. Created us to give us good. That good, only He knows what it is. What we think is good, is sometimes good and sometimes bad. We're not really reliable. We've all made many mistakes choosing something we thought was good only to find out that it was really bad. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't make bad choices. So, if he tells us that we have to cover our hair with the mitpachat, if he tells us that we have to run our staka like it's a business, if he tells us that we have to take the opportunity and join the legion of the Leviim, if he tells us all of these things that seem unusual, surely he has something to rely on. And who would you rather be partners with? Akadosh Baruch Hu, in his opinion, in his truth, or your own conscience, in your own opinion, and your neighbor's opinion, and society's opinion. Only one of you can be right. And it's not going to be anyone other than Hashem. There are other unique things in this parasha, like the Nazir and others, but we've already taken enough time. I think we've already covered the main point that Be'ezrat Hashem will give each and every one of us enough chizuk to overcome our own inclinations that sometimes steer us away from what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants for us. The key is to know that whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu put in His Torah, it's for our interest. It's for our benefit. And surely it's worth it for us to push ourselves a little more to fulfill it because we are the most profitable at the end. With that being said, I'm going to take a drink and you guys could ask some questions. Okay. 
Okay, let's see. Uh, first question that I see, uh, Benny, like a, uh, Dennis. Okay. Uh, good evening, Kodarav. There are a lot of teachings about how a person should learn such a learning besimcha. Thinking in Yirat Shemayim before learning, uh, so that he. What? Thinking in Yirat Shemayim before learning, so that the learning be holy and pure. Learn like the Torah is mamash fire, etc. How can we combine all of these teachings in one's heart and have the best learning we can have? I'm trying to understand your question. Are you asking me? I'm just simply going to assume that you're asking me. How can you learn about, uh, how can you be afraid of God uh, and, you know, afraid of the punishment, afraid of the, the majesty of Hashem, and at the same time, be happy when you're learning Torah and, in essence, in life? Uh, assuming I understood your question, uh, this is the answer. For those that are dear brothers and sisters that are living a, a, a life full of mistakes and, and thinking that fear of heaven is a bad thing, uh, being afraid of punishment is a bad thing, this is a very important answer for them to, to delve into. Because if a person is, let's say, about to eat something, and right before they're about to eat it, somebody comes to them and tells them, no, don't eat! Why? What do you want? You want some? No, 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 it's poison in there. All of a sudden, they hear poison. Oh, they jump back. Whoa, it's scary. You crazy? What's going on? Yeah, it's poison. Were well, you scaring me? Why are you scaring me? I'm not scared. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. Now, a normal person that gets this warning does not become unhappy, but rather the opposite. They're elated, they're ecstatic that their life was saved before it was too late. The objective of fear of the Almighty is not necessarily to scare you for the sake of scaring you. It's not a scary movie that, that you're supposed to, that you watch in order to get the adrenaline running. To learn about Gehenna and Kafakela and Chibuta Kever and all of these horrible, horrific places it's not there to teach you, to, to get your adrenaline rushing in order to make you think, oh, if, uh, 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 you know, uh, if you're observing mitzvot and you see somebody else not observing mitzvot, you know, you should, uh, you know, they're, they're, you could just think of them as, oh, these people are going to get burned in hell and they're going to die and, and ta 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 Or uh, to, to be scared constantly in a sense that uh, if you make one wrong mistake, Hashem is going to cut you into 50 million pieces. That's not the objective. It's not the, there's no, there's no benefit for you or anyone else to to uh, to think of fear of heaven as a, a adrenaline uh, 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 rush in some way or something that uh, you're supposed to uh, get any type of thrill out of. It's in essence the objective is to warn somebody in order to bring them happiness because once a person is warned and they heed to that warning. That, in essence, that creates a relief. It's like a person is standing and then somebody all of a sudden pushes them out. Now, initially, it's a shock. It, it hurts. But then when they realize that because he pushed me out of the way, he saved my life because there was a car coming and I didn't see it and he just saved my life, that brings a certain amount of happiness. Uh, you're elated. You're excited that, oh, I got another chance. I didn't even realize I was in such jeopardy. Like the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Allah Shalom, said that when, when someone asked him, what if uh, my roommate uh, you know, or my friend doesn't want to hear the, about the truth of Torah, about anything, what do I do? Do I stop? He says, no, you keep telling him the truth. Just like if you had a roommate, he tells him, and that roommate tells you, don't talk to me about anything, I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep, no matter what, don't wake me up. And you... Leave the house, and as you get to the bottom of the uh, building, you see that the building is going on fire. You realize your friend that's really nasty, that has an attitude problem, who just told you don't wake me up no matter what, he's in danger of getting burned alive while he's sleeping. So you run inside, and immediately you, sh you shock him back into reality. You wake him up, 
Of course, in the beginning, he's upset because he told you, don't wake me up. But is he still going to be upset? Says the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Once he realizes that you just came there to rescue him from a fire, that he wasn't even aware of, of, of it even happening, surely he's not. He's going to be happier than ever. He's going to love you forever. He's going to owe you forever. That's in essence the message that a person is supposed to get out of fear of the Almighty. Now, sadly, because of our many, many sins throughout all of the generations, needless to say, through our own lives, many people have made enough sins uh, and, and have become addicted to certain sins to the point where to simply tell them this is not good because you will get punished is not enough to motivate them to realize that they are being warned because they're so addicted to a certain sin of immorality of of of, of stealing of uh, of whatever it is that they have created a spiritual shell called a klipa that's on top of their soul that makes them much less uh uh uh, uh uh, conscious and, and much less sensitive to the truth and the only thing that can break the shell is something hard now the words of the Gaumi Vilna is in the Geret is that if he he tells his wife if the kids cursed and hit them viciously and then later on he tells her why did I tell you hit them viciously because sometimes a person makes a, 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 a enough sins that their their soul has a shell on it has a klipa that is like a stone and the only way to get to that to the to the uh, heart of that stone is by breaking it that's why i told you to hit them if they're already at a point where they're cursing speaking to them softly is not going to work you have to break that shell so sometimes a person has enough sins in their life that simply telling them a Mechalel Shabbat is death penalty. Look, it says in Parashat Kitisa. Look, it says in the Shulchan Aruch. Look, it says it over there. Death penalty. Sometimes a person will say, oh, well, death penalty, I'm not going to do it anymore. But that's unfortunately not common. Most people, they say, oh, death penalty, yeah, but I see a lot of my friends driving on Shabbat, no one's dying. So then you have to go a little further. You tell them, listen, Mechalel Shabbat, death penalty, and has no Olam Abba okay who went there and uh you know and, and came back to tell you they tell oh michalel shabbat is considered an idol worshiper meaning your judaism is on suspension you're considered the same thing as buddha you're the same thing as jesus you're the same thing as some other idol no you know you're you're, you're literally putting yourself in a, in a situation where you cannot be counted in a minyan we cannot count you if you are a witness in a wedding the wedding is not valid like somebody told me recently, I went to a wedding. I didn't know it was a, uh, a conservative. I ended up being reform, and I ended up finding out that uh, according to what you're saying, uh, the, the the marriage is not valid. I said, why is it not valid? He goes, well, the the two guys that signed on the ketubah as the witnesses, neither one of them keep Shabbat. I said, well, number one, you're right. They're they're not valid. The marriage is not valid. Number two, why did you go to the wedding? You're not supposed to go to such a wedding. It's chilul Hashem. Oh, is that just an opinion? No, no, no. It's Alcha Moshe Misinai. It's, 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 there's no other opinion. There is no other opinion. You cannot go to a reform wedding. You cannot be part of such things. Friend, brother, sister, doesn't make a difference. It's a Chilul Hashem. It's a desecration of Hashem's name. And whether that's a valid wedding or not, it's not also it's also not an opinion. Two people, two Jews that desecrate Shabbat, sign a ketubah. It's as if two idol worshippers signed the ketubah. And the rabbi that allowed it to happen, he's also an idol worshipper. Be surprised if he keeps Shabbat. The marriage is not, is not valid. Those two, those, that couple are sinning every single second they're together. It's not an opinion. It's Torah. So that's the next thing. That's another hit. Some people, it's not enough. It's not enough. So what do you do? When these people are addicted to pornography, when they're addicted to Hollywood, when they're addicted to material, when they think that when they go to the bathroom, it's only roses that come out, 
when they think that uh, the Torah is only uh, your opinion and not, not from Moshe Rabbeinu, not from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not from uh, uh, the, the sages, they think that it's uh, subjective and objective and this, that, that, all types of things. What happens? What happens is Rabotai Karim, that means that they have a klipa. They have a klipa on their soul and they don't even realize it exists. And that klipa is not like an eggshell. It's more like cement wall. It's more like cement wall, like my dear friend and student Mike Weaver tells me. We deal with cement. With cement, you're not talking about it. It's not like uh, kids' games. Cement, Rabotai Karim. Only way to break it is with a hammer. And not the little hammer that you buy at CVS for $9.99. You have to get a sludge hammer and trach. Why? Because he made enough sins, he doesn't even realize what he can't see. So you have to bring him something that is going to shock his life. You have to show him what it looks like to be in the grave when those Malachi Chabala come and rip him apart to 50 million pieces until he tells them their name. And you have to tell them what's going to happen after that. And, and Kafakela. And how the angels are going to fling him from one soul to the other, to the other place. For Masechet Shabbat, end of Masechet Shabbat, talks about how these angels practically play soccer with his neshama. And then Rabbi Yudaftaya says that his body transforms. He starts looking like an animal. He has hair coming out of his face. And then in the middle of a conversation that he's trying to have with Rabbi Yudaftaya, two different angels come and rip his testicles off. And all types of horrible things that your mind cannot even fathom. And why? Because this is what is required to break his klipa. And it's all real it's all baduk, and it's all not even one percent of what actually transpires over there. What can we do that we live in a generation where the majority of people require that type of teachings in order to realize that they're simply being warned to not go against the shem? not to scare you for the sake of creating some adrenaline rush adrenaline rush for the speaker or for the listener i promise you if you read the words of the benishchai when he talks to jewish ladies in his books and he says tzadika bat israel kdosha why are you gonna sin why are you not gonna be modest please a kadosh who loves you and a kadosh who wants you to do good but just in case my tzadika my my bat israel just so you know if you don't do it you're gonna go to Gehenom, and hashem is gonna burn you and you're gonna suffer severely but tzadika kdosha why are you doing it set that tone and the same thing with rabbi Daftaya, and the same thing with uh, with the reshit chokhma and the same thing with all the chachamim they're not speaking in a, in a way where, oh, if you do this, you're going to get burned and uh, hate you. Eh? No, it's not that. It's, it's the tone is irrelevant. It's simply the way that the passion that comes out of that Jew's heart comes out in different ways. Sometimes it's a loud voice, low voice. It, the passion is coming from simply trying to warn a person warn a person to stop listening to his evil inclination to stop allowing that klipa that cement to to stop him from seeing the truth for what it is some people require that and unfortunately rabotai for some it's not enough even that is not enough for some only the hand of a kadosh baruch Hu himself can actually break the klipa where they've made so many sins and they're so addicted to their sin that until HaKadosh Baruch Hu paralyzes them in one way or another, breaks a leg or two, breaks a bank account or two, breaks a marriage or two, breaks a back or two. And sometimes even that's not enough and HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to beat up his own children time and time again until they realize, I'm only warning you because here is a place you came to work work for akadosh Hu so you get an eternity of good but if you don't work here for akadosh Hu and instead you work to fulfill your own desires and thereby become the servant of the satan himself then unfortunately no one will be able to help you after you leave this world 
because when the rabbi says that that Michalel Shabbat has no share of the world to come, what he was really telling you is simply the title, the title of the punishment, not the details of the punishment. The details of the punishment are more horrible than the Holocaust times a million for eternity. And all a Kadosh Baruch Hu wants to do is simply to wake you up so you start serving him and not the Satan. So if he has to send you a scary word, embarrass you a little bit by telling you that your Judaism doesn't count and you're on suspension, you're considered an idol worshiper, let it be. If he has to send you a scary rabbi that has a voice that sounds like he's gonna about to kill you just with his words, let it be. If he sends you somebody that shows you the Rashid Chokhmah or the Shar Genom or the Sharet Chuva or, or, or any of the other teachings that talk about the details of punishment, let it be. And if he has to give you even a visual of all of those words, a visual that cannot leave your eyes, cannot leave your mind, you literally have nightmares over it because you're afraid that your chuva may not be accepted because you've made so many sins. Let it be. And if he has to break your body into 50 million pieces and you have to be in pain for the rest of your life just for you to do tshuva, let it be. Why? Because at least I know you're still mine, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says. At least I know you're still mine. You're suffering, you're in agony, you went through hell and back, but better be in hell in this world from those words and those insults and all of the other things then you be in hell for a single minute in Shemaim. When a person understands what I just said, then they're elated when they get a warning. They're ecstatic that they get a warning. Why? I'd rather get the warning than the hand. I'd rather get the warning than the outcome of not listening to the warning. And therefore, the people that have the most amount of fear of heaven also have the most amount of closeness to Hashem, most amount of happiness, most amount of excitement about serving HaKadosh Baruch Hu, learning His Torah, knowing that this Torah is fire for my neshama. Why? Because it's either going to help me overcome those lusts, those desires, those filth that goes against Hashem, or it's going to glue me to him even further. Needless to say, it's all amazing. And if this filth that they call immodesty, if this disgusting thing that they call idol worship, if this grossness that they call all types of things that are going against the Shem is going to get in the way, let it burn let it break let it be destroyed in every way shape or form and me not sin even once this rabotai is when a person understands that there is this world work there's eternity enjoy the shekhinah enjoy being next to akadosh baruch Hu forever hence the reason why when rabbi udaftaya spoke through one of the dibukim to the celestial court of heaven and asked akadosh baruch Hu himself is the heavenly court happy that i'm doing these tikkunim to these wicked neshamot in order to expedite their exit out of kafakela and even genom to get them to gan eden instead of them continuing to suffer the agony that they're suffering for hundreds of years in some cases. Is the court happy with what I'm doing? And the court answers Rabbi Yudaftaya and says to him, Akadosh Baruch Hu put a piece of himself into this person. There's a, in essence a piece of Akadosh Baruch Hu, if you will, and then there's the person. Now, Akadosh Baruch Hu's part is pure it's perfect it's untouchable you can't add to it you can't subtract from it but the part that you is dirtied with sins every single time a person forgets to make a blessing 
every time a person looks somewhere inappropriately every time a person touches something inappropriately every time a person steals something every time a person makes a sin it's dirty it's like it's like uh uh, uh not just a, a a spill of milk on or or, or, or something of a liquid on your jacket it's like rust and the more sins the person has the more rust his neshama has to the point where it creates holes in the neshama and the celestial court tells Rabbi Yudaftaya, Akadosh Baruch Hu wants the neshama cleaned from all this rust. And therefore, the court knows that in order for this neshama that's dirtied with sins to be cleaned of all of this rust, of all of this filth, it has to go through a process, an agonizing process that destroys all of it that agonizing process may be kafakela with angels ripping him apart to 50 million pieces and burning him and living and all types of horrible things look at chapter 88 of minchat yudah if you want to know the details if you're not scared after that go to the hospital check yourself to the hospital center because you're dead the process is horrendous the scariest movies they ever made literally are nothing in comparison to the process and that's just Kafakela. Needless to say, Chibuta Kever, needless to say, times a million genom. Akadosh Baruch Hu wants to clean it and therefore decrees, the court decrees a certain sentence in this place. Because the court knows that the clean, the rust off the Dishnashama is going to take 50, 100, 200 years, a thousand years of this agony and pain not because the court benefits out of him suffering but a kadosh baruch wants a clean neshama because that's what he created he just wants his neshama back he wants to clean the shama of his kid so that's the decree that it's gonna be this sentence now if you rabbi yudaftaya can do it faster than the sentence in genom or the sentence in kafakela or the sentence of reincarnation or all three what does Hashem care? Bechavod, go ahead and do it. Because all Hashem wants is to clean the Shema. It's This is the way to clean it, and this is the way to clean it. You can do it faster. Bechavod, enjoy. Go ahead, do it. Chazaku Baruch. In fact, if everybody would do it, the Mashiach would already come. But unfortunately, you have to be a giant among giants among giants in Torah to, 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 to even understand what's the process we don't have people like that in the world today and if we do they're hidden and they're few the point being Rabotai is that Rabbi Daftai gives an analogy and he says it's like a person bought a brand new suit and he wants the suit for special occasions Shabbat suit and all he enjoyed it on Shabbat and all of a sudden something spilled on the suit causes stain and surely he's going to go and get it professionally clean because it's an expensive suit now when he's cleaning this suit that is a process that's not pretty the more difficult the stain the more agonizing the process is if the stain is coming from some superficial liquid okay it's no big deal But if it's coming from something thicker if it's coming from blood or paint tar all types of oils requires a lot more gruesome process a lot more rubbing a lot more this a lot more that now when he's doing this horrible process is he taking revenge against this jacket no does he have anything against this jacket no all he wants is a clean jacket all the kadosh but who wants to clean the shama it's not his fault that you dirtied it he gave you the rules he gave you an open book test and he expects you to pass and one way or another that soul will be cleaned the question is whether you'll clean it or he'll clean it it's much less painful when we clean it and the key is when a person knows all this to be as true as the sun will rise tomorrow this is all good news 
This is all amazing news. Scary? Absolutely. The more you see it, the more you realize it, and the more you realize people are going against the Torah, the more pain it causes you. But nonetheless, you still feel elated that not only you know the truth, but you're following it. But that also causes you a lot of pain when you see that many others not only are not following, they're denying the truth, fighting the truth, and creating for themselves an even thicker klipa, an even, even thicker klipa, a thicker wall of cement that will require even a bigger sludge hammer to break. So yes, while you're happy that you may not have that klipa anymore, or at least not the same level, or not the same thickness. The less klipa you have, the more sensitive you become to Hashem's children. And now your suffering is no longer the same suffering that a person has when he's addicted to desires. That when the girl doesn't look at him, and the guy doesn't call her, and when all of these lustful things don't happen they're in agony and their pain and I don't want to live anymore and all types of stupid things that young people say when they don't get what they want worse than little infants you no longer cry about those things you no longer miss those things but nonetheless you still have agony much worse than theirs because your agony now is because of your sensitivity to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, to the Shechina to a world that is literally almost empty of Shechina to a world where Kadosh Baruch Hu is stepping away from because of our sins, because we're kicking him out. To a world where his own children do not even know who their father is. To a world where you know that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is crying every single day because his kids don't want to even call him Abba. To a world where if things don't change, you will have to see endless sorrow that HaKadosh Baruch Hu will have from seeing himself punishing his own children. Not because he wants to, but because that's what his Torah says it will. So when a person feels that at least they're in the right direction, is it scary? Yes, but it makes a person elated, ecstatic, that they now have a purpose that's no longer just for themselves, but also for the public. A person shouldn't fool themselves to think that they only need to work on other people because the primary objective that a person needs to have is themselves. You help yourself, get closer to Hashem, you'll become better at helping others. But when a person deludes themselves to think that they are here to be the superhero of the world and save everybody else while they themselves barely know anything barely do anything they may have a thicker klipa than all of the people they think are living in error they may want they may they may want to they may be one of those people that the humble arrogant the guy that pretends to be humble but his humility is really arrogance and those are the worst cases so a person needs to help themselves and the more they know the truth the more they cleave to the truth the closer it's going to bring them to a kadosh baruch Hu. and that has endless endless amount of good and joy and and, and fulfillment but it doesn't uh, relieve a person from the agony of, 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 of uh, other things that come from it, from that sensitivity. But again, it's, a, uh, it's the, the happiness that people look for are the happiness of the fools. They look for happiness of, of people jumping and, uh, and, uh, and, and breakdancing in the middle of the street and, and, and pretending to be happy. The happiness of, 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 of the Torah is not that. Sure, that can happen. Sure, a person can dance. Sure, a person can clap and sing. And, but that's not, that's an expression of happiness. Happiness that a person has is a 
permanent state of being that's not always expressed by a smile or something physical it's simply the way a person is and every person expresses it different ways but nonetheless that could only come from a spiritual status and that spiritual status is being connected to a gem so if a person is on that path to at least get on that direction then already they have all the reasons in the world to be happier than anyone else that they know and if everything that i just said to them is simply a different world they have no idea what's going on and so on and as other shem they'll continue learning more to up and enough of the clipa will be peeled off broken and they'll come back to this shield and they'll hear it again and it'll make a bigger impact the next time same words just a more sensitive uh, uh neshama next is it immodest for a man to apologize to a woman for saying lashonara about her and if so how does one go about it uh well it all depends on uh on who what when and how there's not there's no rule of thumb uh but generally speaking uh a uh if let's say for example a uh, person said lashonara to about somebody to another person whether it's male or female the first person they need to notify is not just the person that's the victim that you said lashonara about but also the uh, the people that you said lashonara to meaning those people that heard what you said you have to go to them and say listen everything i said to you it's don't believe it it's lashonara it's actually a sin for you to believe it it's a mistake i'm sorry so that's the first thing a person needs to do second if they uh, you know to, to go and apologize to the other person a apology uh is not necessarily uh, uh always a uh a, a fix because it depends what kind of damage uh that lashonara created if that damage caused that person to lose a job or a, a, a marriage or something like that uh, that sorry is not really going to do very much he has to rectify it he has to fix it in some way uh that t- take a lot of work last but not least uh a person if he is not married or if he is married and she's not married or she's married regardless of what it is uh he shouldn't talk directly to that person uh, as far as like phone call or, or or uh uh or or meet them the best way to do it when it's necessary is simply send them a letter or a uh or a text message uh to to make some type of space between you so it doesn't become uh more than what it is and expose a person to uh to to you know desires and so on uh because of course that's what the yatsara wants he wants you to feel bad for saying something bad about uh, another uh, another lady uh just so you can go and show up at her house or call her and say how sorry you are and that just happens to be the day that she's very emotional and she says oh really wow that's really nice you're the first person that was so nice to me this week and why don't we have coffee together and before you know it you're both going to gain home but not follow shonara anymore so you understand so you have to be smart even with your chuba next uh, uh this is in spanish i have to translate it uh okay. here we go greetings rabbi uh, uh from colombia oh, okay Kola, how much do you have to feel physically attracted to someone in order to proceed with marriage um it doesn't it, well it again it's a uh it all depends on the person's past if a person lived a pure life uh you know and and they they preserve themselves and so on not much will take to for them to be attracted to a uh the opposite uh gender um you know it's a uh, because they haven't uh, spoiled themselves but if a person acted like the village garbage pail that everything touched and everything uh, uh you know it was everybody's property then it's going to take a lot more they're going to be a lot more uh, picky they're going to be a lot uh it's going to take a lot more for them to be attracted and to remain attracted to whoever they choose uh so you have to know that there are two main things for a person uh to look into as far as uh as far as a choice of marriage number one is ideology they have to have the same ideology or a very similar ideology to what you have 
they don't necessarily need to agree with you on every single thing in the world, but they have to have a similar ideology, similar objectives in life, similar beliefs. Uh, you know, if they believe in, uh, 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 let's say, I don't know, uh, they believe that uh, you should have three kids and you believe to have four kids, that's okay. But if they believe you should have three dogs and you believe you should have three kids, that's not okay. Okay, if they believe that, uh, you know, that uh, 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 women are, you know, are, are not defined by their, uh, 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 by their uh, organs, but rather by how they describe themselves and how they feel about themselves, and you're a normal human being that knows that's all nonsense, then obviously there's nothing to be made here. There's no, there's no marriage here. So you have to have similar ideology. That's one. Second thing is, is there has to be some attraction there. Now, attraction doesn't is not lust you don't need to start visualizing this person or what they look like with this and with that no no simple attraction you need to be attracted to this person there has to be some some chemistry there uh, it, it, the one thing that the sages repeat many times is for people not to do things that would disgust their spouse part of the reason why there uh the intimacy between jews uh, that are that are Torah observant is during the night and in and, and, and darkness, not complete pitch dark, but darkness is because there are always possibilities that there will be certain things about the, their spouse's body that could disgust them, that are not necessarily disgusting to everybody else, but could disgust them because everybody has their own things. So for example, it could be, uh, you know, they love them, they're amazing, they have beautiful hair and they have beautiful eyes and everything is beautiful, 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 but they decided that uh, they don't want to listen to the sages and uh, day is like night and night is like day and uh, they see that there's a little tiny microscopic mole on their shoulder and that in itself could break up a marriage. Now you say, oh, wait, how could that be? You could remove it, doesn't matter. Once that goes into their mind, that that's there, they start thinking of all types of crazy things. All types of crazy things. Uh, or it could be a scar, or it could be a, 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 you know, some type of discoloration of skin, uh, or it could even be just something that's in their nose. It's all types of silly things that, again, in the moment of, 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 of passion, uh, it, it could be very uh, uh, vulnerable to certain things. And it could create, it create problems. Same thing with, with the men, women on men. Uh, surely women are much more beautiful than men. It's not, it's not, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, being a male or a female. It's everybody understands that women were created in a much more beautiful form than men are. They're more gentle and so on. But again, that woman, if she is a very uh, materialistic and very physical and so on, she could literally just look at her husband one day with his clothes on and everything is wonderful and she thinks he's the greatest person on planet Earth. But if she decides that she's going to uh, open the door without knocking to see who's in the bathroom, uh, that could literally ruin the whole marriage. Why? Simple. The first time in her life she ever realized that uh, roses don't come out of his body. Uh, so again, it's very important for a person not to disgust, disgust, being disgusting to their family, to others, especially to their wife. So this is also part of the reason why it's always recommended for a person not to uh, uh, eat in front of just anybody, uh, not to eat in the street, not to wear certain things, not to, uh, you know, do certain things, to always be careful of being disgusting. Unfortunately, there are certain people that, you know, they don't breathe and, and, and they think that's righteousness or they don't uh, uh, do certain thing and they just let themselves go. It's important for a person to preserve themselves. Preserving themselves doesn't mean that they have to go to the gym and spend two hours a day running on some treadmill to, to, to look like some uh, Greek statue. No, preserving yourself simply is, 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 is something where a person is maintaining themselves, where they're doing their best to look their best. At the same time, they are hygienic. They're not disgusting. It's, it's uh, unfortunately not once and not twice that I had, you know, different couples come to me. And part of the issue you find out is not really that she, uh, he is uh, yelling at her or she's yelling at him or, uh, or that he's stingy. And uh, no, part of the problem sometimes is literally simple hygiene where one of them just uh, doesn't think that they smell. They don't think that they smell and they've gone to the point where their spouse is disgusted by them. Their spouse is disgusted by them. They don't want to be intimate with them. They're just simply, they, they want to vomit. Now, to fix that is very hard. A, a, a shower is not going to fix it. Why? Because they already have that in their mind. So, 
important to know that a lot of the attraction that that people look for is not necessarily the right type of attraction the attraction that the, the, the physical type of attraction that comes before a marriage is not going to be helped by promiscuity okay the the way that a person becomes more attracted to a person in a uh, before they get married is number one knowing that this person is is is, is had there's some type of chemistry there and also developing a relationship with the, your minds with 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 an ideology with speaking because the second you violate the torah it's and, and be promiscuous before in, before uh, marriage th- this is no longer based on a uh, healthy attraction it's lustful and it becomes very very problematic because you're both creating all types of demons and, and problems for each other in essence you become enemies of each other without realizing it so that healthy attraction that again starts with with emotions with, with expressions with words and a basic level of chemistry will grow drastically once the couple is married and they consummate the marriage why because then that that act between a a, a, a man a Jewish man and a, a Jewish woman is a holy act and they're consummating the marriage and that holy act actually unifies those neshamot unifies those two souls to literally become one and therefore a healthy marriage in a Jewish world there is no she wants he wants there is we there is there is a we have pain there is we are going there's this it's, it's a completely different mentality it's a different feeling and each time that they're 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 together again that intimacy it's sure there's a physical pleasure to it sure there's there's a there's, there's fun and, and joy and so on but there is a certain thing that is unexplainable that happens through it and as a result of it that brings the couple closer that brings the couple closer than they were before that happened but again so long as they are spiritually healthy and 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 they continuously do everything that the Torah says but if people purely act uh, out of their lust out of their uh, their animalistic desires then uh, the difference between them and a horse is not very much not very much unfortunately next uh question since we have free choice does that mean that hashem responds according to what we decide when we decide or does he already know what we will decide and therefore our destiny has already been established uh good question so i have a couple of uh short clips in regards to choice and whether we have choice that's what people think or we have uh, uh something else most people think that we have either free choice or predetermined choice uh one of them is free choice meaning you can do whatever you want and uh nothing happens that's obviously heretical uh and uh that's not true the second thing is is to have a predetermined choice similar to what you just described where a kadosh who already knows everything you're going to do and therefore the outcome of it is already a uh a determined this is also uh incorrect and uh, in the words of the ramban heretical as well not no offense to you it's just simply it's a heretical belief uh just uh because it's uh in essence negates and is antithetical to the entire uh system of the torah of reward and punishment because if a kadosh knows everything that you're going to do and therefore your destiny is already sealed why does he punish you for do for doing bad if he already knew that you're going to do bad no matter what why would he punish you for it you're a robot you're doing bad why should he punish you and the same token if a person does good because I could who put all the good stuff in him all the good stuff in her they, she can't make a sin if her life depended on it why should he reward her she was programmed that way so this is in essence what the part of the heretical beliefs of the Greeks and also believe it or not part of the heretical beliefs of the Muslims that they think everything is maktub maktub means everything is written it's determined it's 100 percent heretical it's against the Torah what does Akadosh Baruch Hu, uh, what's the third line third line is certain stupid people think that Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't know doesn't know he simply doesn't know or like like uh, this Rasha Meza once said it's like he knows as much as you do 
Meaning, you are in Hashem or in the same level, chas v'shalom. So all of these are wrong, all of these are problematic, and in some cases, heretical. Heretical meaning very, very problematic. What is the truth? HaKadosh Baruch has no concept of, of time, of limitations, of past, present, future. Not just for himself, but for all of his creations. There is nothing else but him. He is everything. But that does not, that does not mean that he will influence your choice. Because if he does influence your choice, then the whole system of reward and punishment goes on its face. So even though he knows all of the possibilities that would happen as a result of your actions, he doesn't decide which ones you will make. Meaning, he knows the obviously everything that happened in the past, but also everything that's in the future. But everything that's in the future is not determined already. It's not determined already. It's like, for example, a person is in a crossroads, okay? If he goes uh, 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 right, he will end up going to destination A. If he goes uh, 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 straight, he will go to destination B. If he goes to left, he goes to destination C. If he goes to destination of in between A and B, he'll be a D. In between B and C, he'll be at E. If he goes uh, in those choices, right? So Hashem knows all of those five options. All of those five options. But it doesn't end at those five options because that's a single decision. So he knows that if you make any that decision, you'll go here, 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 here. Now, you've made that decision. Okay? You ended up, let's say, at B. That decision is fine. But now there's another decision that you would have had also only if you have ended up at B. If you would have ended up at A, you would have had different outcomes. If you would have ended up at C, you would have had some of the same outcomes and some not. And if you would have had the uh, D, it would have been the same outcomes, but different results, let's say. So it's again, multiplied again. Now at B, he makes another decision that goes A, B, C, D, or E. And again, he goes to B. So Hashem knows all of those possibilities, but he doesn't choose them for you. But each time that you make a decision, it leads you to a certain destination that opens up a whole new line of doors and options for you. And Hashem knows all of those possibilities as a result of those actions. But then again, there's another choice that opens up another uh, a slew of doors, another five doors, another thousand doors. And Hashem knows all of those outcomes, but He doesn't choose them for you. You choose them. Just like the Torah says, Everything is from heaven except the fear of heaven. Meaning that Hashem knows everything that happened before you. Hashem knows everything that's in you right now. All the tools that you have now. All the thoughts that you have now. All the capabilities that you have now. All the potential that you have now. All of the possibilities that you have now. After you make a certain choice to follow Hashem or to go against Hashem, there is a whole slew of new issues that are available to you, which Hashem already knew, but He didn't decide them for you. They were already there. There were always possibilities, but there were only possibilities if you made certain choices. So just because Hashem knows all of the possibilities of the possibilities of the possibilities to the infinite power, doesn't mean that He controls them or He writes them or it's predestined they're all going to end up at certain outcomes, but you choose what outcome that is based on your decisions. This is why a person gets rewarded or punished based on what their decisions are. And the beautiful thing is, is that the simplest way to, to, uh, uh, to explain it, as I've done, I've learned from Rav Mizrahi and others, uh, Rav Ephraim, uh, that it's the simplest way to explain what I just said is this. If I told you, that I know the future and I can prove it to you by writing on a piece of paper, the only I will see everything you're going to do tomorrow. And I write it on a piece of paper and I put it in an envelope and I seal the envelope and I give you the envelope. And you are going to put that envelope in a safe that nobody in the world could ever see except tomorrow, after you finish the day. You go on your day, you do everything that you uh, uh, do, at the end of the day, you open up the envelope, you see the piece of paper wrote literally every single thing that you did. Just because I knew it doesn't mean that I influenced you. You knew it already. Now, that is a simplistic way of explaining what I just said before. 
there's more details to it because everything i just said is based on single decisions whereas what i said earlier is the culmination of these single decisions to the infinite power to there's no end because every second you look a certain way you smell something you taste something you touch something you think something you go somewhere uh you write something whatever it is every one of those things is a decision and uh and, and, a, and if a person takes into account that uh they're looking to do what Hashem says rather than what feels good then each one of those decisions is motivated uh in the right way but if a person is simply going to follow what their emotions tell them then more times than not they're going to go the wrong way uh and unfortunately all of those things will lead a person to the uh, destination that they don't want to end up being whether that destination is poverty loneliness uh hardship uh, uh a uh whatever infertility uh you know uh you know sickness whatever all types of things that a person doesn't want to have uh but hashem brings that to that person not again not as a punishment in this world because this world is not suited for punishment particularly uh this this world is is suited for a person to be given opportunities and warnings in order for them to not get the real punishment which is infinitely more uh more uh, uh painful than this world and therefore hashem brings a person many many different things in order to redirect them to to help them make a different decision that they would otherwise where a healthy person that hasn't felt pain is more inclined to make the wrong decision than a person that has had a lot of pain as a result of those wrong decisions and they especially if they can make the connection so if a person keeps a a, a person healthy and lets them sin forever that's uh, in essence uh killing them that's enabling them to, to to stay stay bad so at some point Hashem uh gets involved and he brings a person some type of problem and like I said different types of problems it could be money it could be this it could be that it could be a lot of different things not to make them make any decision but to give them different options that are more calculated now he used to jump out of planes because he uh that's what he thought was fun that was his priority in life and that's what he did every single day after Hashem uh you know uh showed him that uh jumping out of planes is not exactly a good idea because it hurts his body and now uh he, he no longer has the physical ability to jump out of planes so now he has different choices that he has to make naturally he can make now he could be stupid and push his body further regardless and thereby risk his life even more than he did before or he can be smart and find something else that's uh you know that can give him the same uh type of uh 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 joy so it's Hashem gives a person sometimes sickness or poverty or loneliness or uh, or whatever it is in this world in order to in essence open up different doors for them to choose differently uh but it's only because of their actions it's only because of their actions their actions led to these doors had they made other actions those the doors wouldn't be the same the sickness or the poverty or the loneliness or the infertility or the divorce or whatever it is wouldn't have been an option had they done differently in the past but the uh the fact that Hashem knows all of those possibilities even before a person makes uh, any of those actions that's simply his uh uh knowledge and his knowledge alone and not something that is uh uh pushing a person to make any one of those decisions proven by the fact that they have different outcomes uh as a result of different choices each time which continue to change and evolve as they make new decisions on top of the decisions whether they made a series of good and then bad or a series of bad and then good or a mix of good and bad each one of them uh get yields an infinite amount of new roads it's like for example there was a uh, a film one time I forget what the name of it is but Hashem, I haven't watched TV or films in many years but there was a film one time where uh they tried to portray of how it's all designed and so on and they in essence made uh showed an illustration of a map and of a road of a person of a journey a person's life and it was like a tree a family tree but each time they made a a, a new choice a new branch would open and it would go this way and then he would make a different choice and and then the that branch would continue but he would have a different branch available to him and then sometimes you would make that choice and a different branch would open and in essence every time a person makes a decision 
whether right or wrong, it opens up new doors. New doors that would have not been available had they made that same decision. So it's a literally a infinite amount of options that Hashem already knows all of those options but does not uh, 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 make those decisions for you. Hopefully that answered it. Where's the show? Uh, Charlie's asking, could you please explain how Rivka was only three years old when she married Yitzchak? Uh, sure, the, uh, if you look at the uh, Torah itself, you don't even necessarily need to go so far as the Midrash or Gemara or anything else. Uh, you can simply see that people in general were very different physically, physically in those days. And one of the, one of the clear examples from the Psukim, from the verses themselves in that parasha, is that you see that when uh, um, uh, when Eliezer comes with his uh, with all of his uh, ten camels with ten servants with uh, you know uh, after a long journey uh, that was really a the derech but nonetheless he gets there with a lot of people a lot of uh, men a lot of uh, uh, camels what does uh, what does Rivka do Rivka goes to the well and takes buckets of water and gives all that water to each one of the camels. Now, I'm not sure when was the last time you picked up a bucket full of water, or if any of you ever picked up a bucket full of water. I know we were little kids in Israel when they still used to, you know, wash the floor with sponge on, you know, and a map, and, you know, <laughs> yet these big buckets of water that weighed a ton. Now, for, for a three-year-old of today that we know of, the three-year-old physically uh, that's, that's, you know, barely a foot tall and maybe uh, 40 pounds, uh, 50 pounds, you know, to, to pick up a bucket that's probably heavier than him uh, is not realistic. And therefore, from, from the verses themselves, we see that physically, physically, Rivka was not like the three-year-old of today. She was obviously stronger and bigger than a three-year-old of today, or else she would have not have been physically capable of bringing enough water to have 10 men and 10 uh, uh, camels drink. Do you understand how much a camel drinks? We're not talking about, oh, he drank a little sip and that's finished. Each one of them drank the satiation. We're talking about multiple trips to the well. Go try to go, uh, not even to a well. Try everyone, anybody, even the person that goes to a gym. Go fill up your bathtub with water. Fill up your bathtub with water. Then go ask your wife or your mom, where, depending on you're single or not, to give you a bucket. Okay? Take that bucket, fill up that whole bucket with water, and try to lift it just to, to, to your chest. And realize how heavy it is. Needless to say, a three-year-old of today cannot do it. Can I, can't even push it. It's so heavy. So for a, a three-year-old of today to do what she did, obviously it's not possible. Hence the reason why she was physically not like a three-year-old of today. She was much bigger and stronger and so on. Now, that also is a uh, 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 doesn't mean that she was like a 30-year-old uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, superhero. But she was literally not like a, uh, a three-year-old. But nonetheless, he uh, waited until she was six uh, for them to consummate the marriage, which means that from, from, from just common sense, it seems like she was more like a, uh, a young girl that was, let's say, bat mitzvah, 12 years old, 11 years old, uh, uh, you know, uh, almost marriageable uh, uh, age, and according to the Torah terms, almost a woman is 12 years old. You know, is, you know almost a woman, even according to today, 12 years old, uh, depending on how much poison they put in, hormones they put in their food. Uh, but the point being is, is that you see the person is almost a puberty, give or take, but it's not at full strength versus, let's say, the six-year-old that's like, you know, fully grown, I don't know, 18 years old. Okay, so that's, that's also a uh, thing. But nonetheless, that 12-year-old can do a lot of the same things as an 18-year-old uh, can do physically, but not necessarily always. So that's also why there was a delay of, uh, uh, of three years where they married at three, but consummated the marriage at six. And that's, again, also according to the, uh, the verses. It's not, uh, uh, there's no debate here, uh, but that's the, that's the answer. Okay, I think we're almost done. I'm going to try to see maybe I can answer one or two quick answer, quick questions. It's already Thursday morning here in Israel. How hard to keep up with all the Torah from around uh, the world 24-7. Uh, yeah, I mean, it all depends on how much, uh, you know, how many different uh, things you read, how many uh, speakers you listen to. 
I've always told people that to, to listen to more than, you know, two speakers is already uh, uh, too much. I know that people, for whatever reason or another, they think that once they learned, uh, you know, 100 shulim or whatever, a, uh, 200 shulim of a certain speaker, whether it be me or any other rabbi, that's it. They've learned everything that they, uh, they know, which is, it's really, you know, if that, if that speaker continues to bring new issues and new Torah and, and is prepared, there is a uh, it's actually behooves you to continue only listening to that one speaker rather than to change around because if you look at any of the sages that have written and have spoken throughout all of the generations one of the things that you notice from their books is that they continue to develop uh not just a uh, new ideas but even the old ideas because as they're growing, they're learning more, and thereby they're flourishing more. So the earlier works of the Ben Ishchai and the earlier works of Rav Ovadia and the earlier works of, of, of the Gaumi Vilna, of the earlier works uh, versus their later works are, you know, it's, you see the, 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 the uh, extraordinary developments that even though it was unbelievable to begin with, and uh, we wish we could only be the dust under their feet, even when Rav Ovadia wrote his commentary on Rishit Chochmah when he was only nine years old. I only wish I could understand the Rishit Chochmah like he understood it at nine years old. But nonetheless, when you compare that Rav Ovadia, that little young boy Ovadia, versus the Rav Ovadia that wrote when he was 70, 80, 90 years old, they're, they're, you see that it's a, uh, uh, I can't say a world apart, but you can just simply see that there is a extraordinary amount of development. So if the speaker that, uh, 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 or the writer that you are listening to or reading from is continuing to develop, then you should actually focus even more of your attention and time only to study his work uh, versus to spread yourself elsewhere because what ends up happening is that as he's growing and you're focusing on his work, you're going to grow uh, along with it. Whereas if a person uh, spreads themselves, uh, you know, in different places, then what they end up doing is that they end up getting the tidbits of different speakers or different Chachamim's ideas, but never the full concept. So they'll know a, uh, a little about a lot of different things because they'll never truly get the full concept of anyone of those rabbis because those concepts, those ideas, those chidushim uh, take time to develop and sometimes it's years, sometimes it's months, sometimes it's days. So he could speak one time or write one time, but then you'll see a series of articles develop and build up to a completely new development, a completely new idea, uh, a new uh, direction, a new flower that would, that uh, bloomed out of it that had you not followed the whole series, you would have not even recognized that the new flowers even connected to the old flower so it's it's it behooves a person to actually focus on a single chacham and definitely not more than two if they want to develop in their torah uh i know that this is against the nature of most people people like to you know delve into speakers like they delve into food today chinese food tomorrow uh japanese the next day uh, indian the next day it's uh i don't know iraqi the next day it's uh i don't know uh tripoli every italian uh the irish i don't know they want every day they want a different dish and this is a mistake it's a mistake and it's a uh a per- just like a person should be an expert in uh in one mitzvah they should obviously fulfill all of the mitzvah, but they should become a real expert in one mitzvah and then obviously try to do others also after they become a real expert. Same thing is with a certain chokhmah, a certain chacham. A person could be an expert in one chacham. They know they've grown with them. And you'll see that many of the people that became Talmidei Chachamim, they didn't do what people do today and, uh, and listen to everybody and read everybody. They focused a period of their time just on this. Rav Wasserman. He learned with great sages, great rabbis at a certain time of his life, but then eventually went to the Chafetz Chaim and he spent a certain several years with Chafetz Chaim and only Chafetz Chaim. And that, that, he didn't go back and forth today, it's this one to that, tomorrow is that one. No, same thing with the Sabami Slovotka, the altar me, me, me uh, Sabami Novarduk, the altar of, of, of Novarduk. He spent a, uh, 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 first, I don't know, 30 years of his life learning a, uh, a, a certain base from from Chachamim that he learned in yeshiva and so on, and then he met Rabbi Israel Misalant. 
he brought Rabbi Yisraeli Salant, and after 13 speeches, 13 lectures, his whole world view uh, uh, completely changed for eternity, forever. It's it's a uh, 13 lectures. Of course, he gets more out of a single lecture than we can get out of a year of lectures. But nonetheless, it's you know when he asked Rabbi Yisraeli Salant, you know if he should go learn with the Rav Brisk, Rabbi Yisraeli Salant said, "Why would you do that when you have?" The kolal over here with my talmidim, and you have uh, Rabbi Tzach Blazel, uh, Rabbi Sim Chazitz and Mikelim, uh, all of these giant geonim that uh, are on the same path. Why would you go to a different shita? It doesn't make any sense. Now, of course, the Savvish Davodak uh, uh, listened to his uh, listened to Rabbi Sami Salant and ended up becoming the uh, not only a much a million times bigger than what he would have been any other way, but he also became the founder. Of, uh, of of over 70 yeshivot that the world stands on till this day to a certain extent 70 yeshivot he ended up opening but not by delving into different things every day there are periods of time for you know sometimes you can grow with the rabbi for your whole life if he's like a a, a rabbi vadia uh, 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 that that's pretty much you know forever and Hashem blessed with years and, and, and endless uh, wisdom you can grow with that Rav and only that one Rav forever if he is uh, somebody else there's a certain shita that only does this only focus on this you can grow with him for five ten years and once you see it ten years he's still focused on that first ten year uh, uh, period he's not focusing on that then of course you could change but the point is is that when people today they're brand new to the Torah and they're already acting like they are one of the geonim of the Gemara that they can go into Yerushalayim learn with Rab, uh, Rabban Yochanan then go to Bavel and <laughs> and go to Chachamim of Bavel and uh, Ravashi Ravina Rade, no, ooh. people if people only understood basics basics of one Chacham they're already fortunate more fortunate than the wealthiest people in history uh, but unfortunately people you know again treat Torah and Chachamim like they treat their uh, they treat their uh, lunch they want uh, they want to pick and choose every day different seasonings and it's a mistake it's a mistake because what ends up happening is that they will end up knowing uh, enough to hold a conversation but not enough to get into Gan Eden uh, answered the question already yeah uh let's see well, I, I really don't like wine and grape juice can i make kiddush uh, on shabbat on bread um well you have to uh you have to drink uh, some type of uh, uh grape juice or uh wine and there's different flavors of grape juice and you can find i'm sure you can find a grape juice that's a different flavor than what you have uh, there's certainly something you can find um or if not then you could have a, your wife drink it I have drink it. Misha, it's, uh, it's a religious couple allowed to use surrogate uh, that's not Jewish. And would the baby be considered Jewish? No and no. Not allowed to use it and not allowed, and the baby is not Jewish. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, this guy was telling me that it's maximum 12 months in Gainom. I said that it's wrong. Uh, it can be uh, an eternity. Then he replied, no, because the Gemara has another opinion that says it's Shabbat to Shabbat morning. It's only 49 days, for example. Pesach, Shavuot. Uh, it seems nobody's scared uh, of hell. And they only think of now. And, uh, okay, well, I mean, it, listen, it, it, it's if you're if you're dealing with a scholar uh the scholar is never going to talk like that because the scholar knows that the gemara in yerushalmi says that uh uh the gemara has is is poor in one place and rich in another uh meaning that in one place you'll see that there's a certain sugiyah a certain subject that's being discussed where there's only a single line being said and then there is a different Gemara that talks about the same subject, but it gives you five pages. Uh, so in one place it's poor, it's only a single sentence, in another place it's rich. And therefore we don't learn Gemara, we don't learn Torah 
from a single place. We learn sugyot by taking all of it. The, the oral Torah is a nervous system, that it's all connected. Now, it may not look like the, uh, the, uh, the muscles on your feet can affect the uh, pain you have in your back or even a twitch that you have next to your eye, but everyone that went and has ever gotten uh, 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 you know, one of these Chinese uh, medicines of acupuncture uh, knows that, yes, they are. Is it just like you have a physical nervous system? Needless to say, there is a spiritual nervous system. And therefore, we don't learn from a single place. And guess what? We also don't learn just from the Gmarot, because you also have the Chachamim that elaborated what it said, also from different places. And therefore, when you learn an actual sugya, like you really, you go and you learn, a, 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 you look at one of the responses that Rav Ephraim has in his uh of the Israel. Or you look at uh, 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 the responses, Yabia Omil. Or you look at any of the Chachamim. When you look at how they address a question from beginning to end, they don't address a question like I'm addressing questions, yes, no, with a little bit of color on it and talk to you for five minutes. They literally, you know, uh, spiritually, uh, make a surgery on the subject from every single scope, from every chacham in the last few thousand years, every perspective, every uh, dispute, every excuse that the other side can come up with, every excuse that already came up with, and they bring everything together before they pass it an actual halacha. So when somebody tells you no, because it says so in this gemara, or yes, because it says so in this gemara, if they really mean that, if they think that's the reason, then that just simply means they actually don't know Torah. They don't know what wisdom is even. They don't know anything. So there is no debate to be made with such a person because they're literally too ignorant and arrogant to even debate with. But if they're going to bring you multiple sources and multiple chachamim and multiple this, and they give you a legitimate argument, then you have something to debate. And what ends up happening is that the subject of Gehenna, there is no debate. There is no debate. There is no like a group of Chachamim that say maximum 12 months and another group of Chachamim eternity. There is no debate. Debate is only by foolish people that don't know anything. Because if you actually study the subject, not from a single sentence and not even from a single lecture, but you actually study the subject from the sources, from the Gemara, from the from the from the Chachamim. There is no debate, like the Rambam writes in his commentary on Mishneh Torah. The introduction in itself is a book of its own. He said there are certain things that people debate on, and there were today or the debate on in let's say the Gemara. This was not debated in a uh, at Mount Sinai. And needless to say, this was not debated on by the Tanaim uh, as far as who's right and wrong like people think. They were in essence bringing many of the different possibilities and arguments in order to simply prove why the law is the law. So there is no debate of one side. It says it's 12 months Ganom and no more, no way. That's it. That's Allah. And another side saying, no, it is 13,417 years, point two. No, there is no argument. Everyone that has studied the subject seriously knows it is not possible for Gehenna to be 12 months. And I don't even mean studied it extensively like they studied it for weeks and they studied multiple volumes of books. Studied it, I literally mean for that particular question, studied it seriously for five minutes. Five minutes without any books, without any books, purely using the logic that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gifted them. And understand, every single day, you make a, hundreds of decisions. Those decisions have an impact on your eternal life, not just your life here, not just your life that day, your eternal life. If a person understood how a Kadosh Baruch Hu is judging a woman in this week's parasha for being secluded with another man, needless to say, how he judges a woman that's a, uh, 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 per uh, promiscuous with another man, but not once, twice. 
Not twice, five times. Not five times, a hundred times. And not even promiscuous with a man, but she walks around immodesty and she causes other people to do certain things. And not just once, for 30 years of her life. So to give all of those women I just described the same maximum 12 months is not only stupid, it's evil. To say such a thing is only comes out from stupid people who don't know anything beyond their ego and what they want it to be what they want the answer to be. They want the answer to be 12 months because they know that they are criminals and they feel that if they say 12 months, therefore, no matter how much of a criminal they are, they only need to worry about a year sentence. There's no logic whatsoever to such a person that, that is literally like of, of, of Am Israel because Anyone understands one person murdered one person, another person murdered 50, another person raped five, another person violated Shabbat once, another person uh, is Hitler, another person is an idol worshiper, but only for three years. All of them a year? All of them get the same sentence? So no normal person would think that, and needless to say, no lover of Hashem would ever say such a thing. About a Kadosh Baruch Hu You think that a Kadosh Baruch Hu would make such a world that everybody gets the same sentence no matter how much the person, how many crimes he makes, if he only makes crimes for the first 30 years of his life and not forever, or if he only makes crimes for one year, or if he only makes crimes for one day, if, if these people literally, if they thought to themselves and listened to the manure that comes out of their mouth, they would never want to speak again for saying such heretical things that are literally too stupid to discuss. But what can we do that people don't want to learn? Hence the reason why we had the other section of the shoe. Where we said there's sometimes a klipa that's thicker and more difficult than cement. Those are those people where they're sure that their mistake, their heresy, and their stupidity is right. They're sure of it, just like you're sure that the sun will shine tomorrow. Does that make it right? No, it, make it makes it unfortunate. Unfortunate to be them, unfortunate to be next to them, and needless to say, unfortunate to listen to the garbage that comes out of their mouth and actually being impacted by it. Because anyone that studied the subject would know it's not possible for such a thing to work, not even in this world does such logic work. No court in the world, even in third world countries, will give 10 different criminals the same exact punishment. No court in the world will give 10 different thieves the same type of punishment. Even if it's the same crime, they don't give you the same punishment. Why? Because he's black, he'll get 10 years. He's white, he's going to get 6 months. He's something in between, but we don't like his father, 30 years. He's that guy, he gets 2 days. He's uh, rich, nothing. He goes free, in fact, give him a bonus for stealing. Even the same crime doesn't get the same type of uh, punishment. In this world, needless to say, in the world of truth, is it not possible to punish people the same thing? But you have to understand, they don't want to know the truth. It's not a matter of, you're not debating truth versus truth. You're not debating uh, 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 even truth versus lie. You're debating with, one person wants to know the truth and the other person will do everything in their power to deny the truth and try to reinvent it no different than how the christian idol worshipers have been doing it for the last two thousand years by taking excerpts of our torah excerpts of our sages manipulating it with their spiritual manure and turning it into their truth that they've literally impurified the world with this is unfortunately not just done in christianity it's also done by some people that call themselves jews that simply do not want to believe in the truth they want to believe in their fairy 
fairy tale harry potter life where everybody goes to heaven no matter how much of a criminal they are because they want to feel good about them being criminals they want to feel good about their family being criminals they want to feel good about everyone that they know remaining criminals because they cannot look in the face of any of these people and actually tell them the truth because they know that they would be accusing them of what they themselves are guilty of and since they don't want to change they can't expect anyone else to and therefore the lie they feed themselves by default has to be fed to others and the more it's fed to others the more they start believing it themselves so much so that they reject the truth even if Moshe Rabbeinu himself would come down from Mount Sinai and tell them they would still deny it because they don't want it and those people are literally the in, in the worst possible shape even worse than an atheist even worse than an idol worshiper even literally even worse than some cats and dogs in the street that at least know who the creator is they're in worse shape than those people and those types of people typically it requires the hand of god himself to break their klipa and try to save them and as a gemara for them masechet sanedrin daf tzadik kadosh baruch Hu says to us that it's it before mashiach comes going to give everybody an opportunity and either they're going to do tshuva or he's going to send them haman what's haman haman is haman nebuchadnezzar hitler uh, gog all the worst possible things that broke all klipot broke all all uh, recognition of, of of anything but that's what it took to wake certain people up and give them a chance even if that means they woke up five seconds before they got the death penalty at least now they may have a share of the world to come after suffering a certain amount because at least now they know that there is a judge and that there, there is a God and he doesn't skip anything so sometimes that's what needs to happen it's it's in the Gemara it's it's in a it's it's everywhere if if these people simply understood what they're saying in Shema Yisrael Shema Yisrael just just go read Shema Yisrael the whole everything something you read every single day read it in the language you understand if English Russian just read it literally and already you understand there are there is a judge there is there's there's consequences they're severe but they also vary based on who what when where how to say everybody gets the same sentence honestly sad we should really we should really add almost add like a day of mourning for such people that's how sad it is because it's 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 not it's not intellect it's klipa it's a very very serious klipa that's high level of apikosut to not know no problem to to know incorrectly no problem to deny the truth and and determine what the truth is even though it defies all logic it's very sad situation it's a good sight it's like these women that uh that uh uh, or men that uh, say that you can you, you know you ask them what is a woman and they say oh you know it's it's how you feel what about biologically no 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 it's not biological you can look at a, a woman and uh it can be have male uh, uh body parts these are these are sick people these are you know they be, should be instituted these are sick people these are you know I mean, you cry over them i don't know it's just it's, you know we also cry you know honestly there's the part of we say you know there's 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 a person where there's uh there's wantful sinners well you know sinners that are simply they want it they want to continue that way we wish for that to uproot them from the world not because we hate them but it's better for them to be uprooted from the world before they sin even more okay Rabotai, you have asked some uh big questions Thank you very much for asking them. Thank you very much for bringing some more out of uh, this uh, this uh, this this body, this uh, little piece of chicken, and uh, allowing us to be useful in the world. 
Hopefully you guys uh, understood and got some chizuk out of it. Uh, I, I think I uh, certainly did. There's a lot of uh, good ideas that uh, we have to continue building on. Uh, Be'ezot Hashem, uh, we'll uh, continue to grow, we'll continue to learn. Uh, for that person that's asking the sources that are about the duration of Genom, there are many, many sources. Uh, you could just watch the shiu uh, that I made called Genom. Uh, it's uh, Musar Pir Kavot number 84, Genom. And in there I bring many, many sources uh, from the Torah, from the Nevi'im, from the Gemara, that talk about not just a genom that's more than 12 months, but an eternal genom. The Gaon Mivilna discusses it, Rabbi Yudaftai discusses it, the Gemara Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 17a discusses it, uh, the Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin, Masechet Avodah Zarah, uh, the, uh, the last verse in Isaiah, chapter 66, uh, in Teilim there's many times, in fact, even in your Sidul, when you pray every single day, it talks about it. It talks about it. The uh, parashat Korach. Korach is still in Genom till this day. How could he be in Genom till this day, uh, where there is a certain place in the desert that you can still hear his voice uh, screaming and with all of his followers uh, once a month? Uh, how could he? What is he? The only one that ever got uh, uh, Genom for three thousand three hundred thirty-three years, and all the other wonderful people they they only get maximum twelve months. It's 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 literally it defies all logic to think that Genom could only be. For 12 months, it defies all Torah. It's outright stupid uh, to think such a thing. And hence the reason why the Ramban writes in his Shara Gmul that people that uh, say such a thing, it's not just being a heretic, it's turning God into an evil God, chas uh, So it's, 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 it's just, it's beyond, it's beyond stupidity. Uh, but I'm not talking about stupidity as far as these people can be architects, they can be scientists, they can be whatever. It's spiritual stupidity. It's a very, very sad state of affairs that we have in the world today that people actually believe this stuff. Uh, but eh, it's just so much that we can do. Be'ezrat Hashem, we have, uh, uh, I can give you a little sneak peek on a, on a project that we have right now for, for uh, anyone that wants to be a partner in it we actually have been working on for the last year almost on a new movie, the next big movie, which is Genom. And it's going to be something that the world has never seen before and Bezat Hashem will never have to see again uh, after they see this movie. And uh, this is coming out very, very soon, Bezat Hashem. Uh, it'll uh, discuss everything, everything, everything and everything about Hashem. And uh, anyone that uh, knows the history of our movies, Hashem took back his millions, Tikkun Abrit, uh, the uh, movie of um, uh, the Chibut uh, Kever, uh, World of Lies, these movies literally reach, reach millions and millions of views and, and, and hundreds of thousands of hours of watch time. They, they transform people's lives and it costs a lot of money to produce these movies. Uh, it costs a lot of money to to bring these movies to different places. We're, we're talking about, you know, uh, when we first started doing movies, it was, you know, $150,000, $200,000. Now it's, you know, the budget is north of a half a million dollars uh, for, for, for this movie and more. Uh, it's huge, huge money. Uh, and uh, my recommendation is for anybody that wants to be part of the one and only movie about this subject, um, you know, let us know. You could contribute in any way, shape, or form. You contribute a lot. You contribute a little. There's really no limit. Uh, to put it that way, there's. It's just a. It's a. It's a. It's a part of our work to try to help the most difficult klipot uh, break. Uh, so hopefully they go back to Akadosh Baruch So anybody that wants to be a part of it is more than welcome to. Um, we don't have a campaign for it. I've, I've actually this is the first time I'm ever mentioning it. Uh, but since you guys have asked so much and you've been uh, nice enough to listen to me for the last three hours, I figured this is uh, some food for thought. And uh, like I said, it's a, it's a huge budget, it's a huge project, and it's Bezat Hashem going to be uh, a bigger success than all of the other movies we've done uh, combined, uh, just because of the nature of the subject of, of, of what we're, where we're at in, uh, in the world also. So for any of you that want to be uh, involved, let us know. Uh, and uh, you know, there's all types of things that can be done. And now that we're in this stage, once it's out, you know, we're limited uh, as far as what certain things can be done. Uh, thank you again for learning with me. Thank you again for 
pushing the envelope a little bit, Baruch Hashem, and may Hashem bless each and every single one of you with Bracha, Tzlacha, Chaim Arukim, Shlemim, Elim, Torah, Mitzvot, Gnut Chasadim. And uh, for anyone that wants to uh, contribute to all of our work, can go to bezratashem.org or bhtorah.org uh, or go to our Bezrat Hashem app uh, or uh, send a check or simply just keep watching the shiurim and at the very least sharing them for free. Amen ve'amen.